tonight allows people a release for all the hatred that they keep Welcome inside. back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Y'all thought it was gone, right? Y'all thought it was over. Let me tell y'all something, though. When he say the voice of the people, he mean that shit. It's the return of the underdog. The voice of the people. <laughs> So they asked me, so they asked me. Young, boy, young boy, how you gonna come back? Gonna come back? I try to I, I come back like 32. 32. I jump back like 33. 33. Ugh. Ugh. Hit me. Hit me. That's nothing. <laughs> now for the main event, the main focus. Yeah. I told you, man. Oh, I'm in the position, something like that. <laughs> welcome back, welcome back, boxing fans, boxing heads, casual fans, hardcore fans. It's another edition, Sunday night. Today is August 4th, and uh, this will be our recap show of all this weekend's action. Joined with two great guests, Seth Mayhem Mitchell, coming off of his... Uh, uh, lackluster performance versus Jonathan Banks, but definitely avenging that loss. And we're going to have Brooklyn Zone, female phenom, uh, definitely making waves in the women's boxing. Huge following. Heather, the Heat, Hardy. Uh, right off the bat, I got to, of course, you know, introduce my co-host, uh, the one and only, Victor Salazar. Vic, what's going on? Follow Vic at Boxing Voice underscore Vic. And, uh, you know, he always tweets back. Vic, so what's good, man? How, how was your weekend, brother? It's good, man. Uh, a little slow on the boxing schedule, but, you know, it's summer, so. Vic, I'm impressed, man. I'm impressed. Your banner's looking excellent back there. I'm not seeing any uh, corners of the wall. You, you, you definitely moved. I, I see even the lighting looks better. I feel like trash, man. I still haven't been able to get myself situated. But, Vic, I got some, some good stuff here for you. Really, really good stuff. Uh, after last week's show, uh, you know, we spoke about some guys that uh, have been writing iTunes review, and I got four for you, four new ones since the last show. And... Um, they're all just as good, so they're really short and quick. I want to go ahead and uh, – this one I want to go ahead and give a shout-out to your guy, Vic. This is actually your friend, uh, Pitcher. Remember Pitcher on Twitter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. All right. So the uh, reason I'm, I'm giving him a shout-out and I'm going to read his review is because uh, it's sort of like religion here. We converted him. And uh, and you'll see what I mean when I read this. So he says uh, on August 2nd, he said, this show is hands down the most fun show to listen to. They really found the groove. I tried listening to this show in its infancy, and it was terribly unorganized and unfocused. Way too much on interviews with fighters. Now Ness and Vic found a groove. These two are the most, I mean, are almost never in agreement which keeps the show interesting and fun. Great job, Ness and Vic. And the reason that I wanted to, you know, give him a shout-out and read his iTunes review is because he tried us in the beginning, <laughs> and he clearly left us, but he's back. Um, and that means, you know, one of two things, uh, that we've definitely found our groove, as he says, and that... He's back listening, and at the end of the day, that's what's most important, that we get all the boxing fans listening. So then we got another one from 0540. By far the best boxing show out there, hosted by two knowledgeable boxing fans, Ness and Vic. The show will entertain and inform you for over two hours. Special guests, including marquee fighters. 
are often interviewed live, and the vast assortment of viewers and callers always makes for a great show. Also, I got to say that the questions that need to be asked always get asked with these guys. And I did and did I mention this show is twice a week, every Thursday and Sunday. If you're a hardcore boxing fan, look no further because this is it. That's a great review, and I wanted to give him his props for giving us that five-star review rating. Um, there's one here that <laughs> when I read this, you're going to crack up, but we'll save the best for last. Uh, this one comes from I Am Brockton. Uh, the Boxing Voice is by far the best boxing podcast out there. We'll turn the casual fight fan to a diehard boxing head. It isn't a group of people hating on one particular fighter till they bore you to death. It's a community of fight fans calling in, voicing their opinions, and having heated debates to allow you to form your own opinion. Look forward to it every Thursday and Sunday. Three hours of complete boxing coverage. The reason that I wanted to, you know, give these two, the last two that I just read, a shout out and read it out loud is because they're giving props to our audience, our listeners. And I'd say that every week. We're nothing without you guys. Your calls is what makes this show completely different from any other show. Your calls distinguish us from everyone else. This is your platform. We are the voice of the people, but you are the people. So reviews like this will help find more people that want a place where they can just, you know, get it off their chest. So the last one, Vic, prepare yourself. This is, uh, I hope you're sitting down. Clearly you are. I can see you. Cyberspace Desperado says, me and my wife are fans of the show. Nothing like it. A Sunday night listening to the boxing voice while making love to my wife. Thanks. <laughs> what the bejeebus? Dude is stroking while thinking of Vic. I can't believe it. But I just wanted to shout out those, uh, you know, four guys and female that uh, took the time out to give us a review on iTunes. So remember. Remember to rate us five stars on iTunes. It's extremely important. It helps us expand our show worldwide so we can get more South African callers. I know you guys are loving the Mali Bangwe intro. Only way it's going to get played if more people from South Africa call. But we got Argentina, we got Mexico, we got all the regions, all the countries, everything basically calling in, but we just need more. So, uh, of course, I said our two guests are going to be Seth Mitchell and Heather Hardy. Got some things to talk about. Um, definitely want to give a big shout out to uh, one of our donators this past week. Shout out to Yayo from Philly uh, for his generous do donation to our calls and uh, little message saying that he loves the show. Thank you, Yayo. Hope you're listening to your personalized shout out. Uh, and remember, you can become a supporter just by listening just by reviewing us on iTunes, just by hearting the show, liking us on YouTube, simply sharing the link to another boxing fan. You are a supporter just by doing that. You want to take it another level and uh, you know show your love for the show by uh, definitely going out there, checking out theboxingvoice.com and all the articles, stopping at the store and buying a Boxing Voice t-shirt. Do so at the Boxing Voice uh, store. Don't forget we got the Canelo Alvarez glove giveaway. Uh, we will be giving that glove away September 15th. And uh, if you're new to the show and you don't know how to join that giveaway, you just got to head on over to theboxingvoice.com, click the donate button, $1.40 gets you in the contest. With that donation, I will have your information, first and last name, and address to send the glove out to you if you're the winner. And we will be announcing the winner September 15th, the Sunday, the big show after the big fight, the one. And uh, I just want to give a big thank you to all our donators. And you can become a donator by just going to theboxofvoice.com on the homepage, clicking the donate button. Anything you give always helps. Remember, the biggest donation you can give us is an iTunes review. So... Something I wanted to talk about, Vic, with you and the listeners, um, this is the boxing voice, the voice of the people, so we already know that this is our show. 
us boxing fans. Now, the problem that us boxing fans have, Vic, is that the rankings on other sites, other outlets, we can never agree. Whether we agree on one person being in the top ten or the pound for pound or et cetera, et cetera, it's never completely right. So the Boxing Voice has officially launched their own Boxing Voice rankings. And these rankings are going to be for the fans. You know, we have all the gripes and concerns about our, about other ranking systems. So this is your opportunity to have your voice be heard. A privilege that you always get here on a Boxing Voice. So what you do is you head on over to the boxingvoice.com forward slash rankings. There's a comment box at the bottom. You tell us who deserves to be where, who you think goes where. We take that into consideration along with uh, Robert Palmer, uh, Palmer, excuse me, who has collectively gotten these rankings together over uh, the, pa the past year, basically. And between him and Yuli Martinez, they have come up with the rankings that we have there now. Now, these rankings clearly need to be changed, but they need to be changed with your input, the boxing fan, the hardcore fan, the people that truly watch this sport. See, this way, vacant titles, belts, none of that matters. Who deserves it? Do you feel Curtis Stevens deserves to be in the top 10, top 15 of the middleweight division now because he beat Saul Roman? Or do you feel that he doesn't because Saul Roman was a 154-pounder? Should we put him in the ranking simply because it's rumored that he's going to be fighting Gennady Golovkin in November? which every other ranking system is probably going to do just so they could coincide with the television fight. If you think that's what we need to do, you tell us in the comment box. If you think that's not what we need to do, you tell us in the comment box. And clearly there's share buttons so you can share it to your friends on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, Dig, Redix, uh, all that stuff, stumble upon. So moving on with the show because we took 12 minutes there with all the hype. Headlines, Vic. Uh, Friday, August 2nd, ESPN in Miami, but not Miami. Oklahoma, Miami, where the lights kept going out. Obviously, 14 and Louis Franco's 14 round draw. Two featherweights. Franco coming off something like a 10 month layoff. Uh, he made it clear that he was still working out, he was always in shape, and he showed that. Javier Fortuna with a lot of hype behind him. And this fight kind of fell flat, Vic. I need your intake. What did you think? Because I reached, I took out the Twitter because I knew today I was going to get a lot of heat because I, I'm always big enough for Tuna. But like me, a lot of the boxing fans saw Fortuna winning. They didn't think that he deserved to have a draw. Well, uh, the fight Vic, was very you weird. Car over there? What's up? You in a race car? I might be. No. The fight was very weird to me. Uh, Fortuna in, in the first four or five rounds, um, I don't know. I, I thought Franco was landing clean shots. Uh, Fortuna looked to be a little wild. I mean, you, you didn't see Fortuna just throwing, like, trying to throw, like, left hooks from out of nowhere and totally missed him. Uh, what I will say is uh, I didn't think Fortuna did enough to win, in uh, my opinion. Uh, I, I'm all right with the draw. Um I had Franco winning 96-94. Hmm. Okay. I had Fortuna winning. I felt that Fortuna kind of took over, I believe, after the fifth round. Um, Franco, what he did show is that whether it was a 10-month layoff or not, he's very evasive, that guy. The way that he ducks, he was ducking under a lot of shots. Um, and... Uh, I wonder how that fight would have turned out with Gary Russell Jr. Well, I mean, what can we base Gary Russell off? I mean, he hasn't fought much anyway. Uh, I, I still want to see that fight some way down the line, but until Gary Russell fights someone with a post, I can't say he's better than Fortuna at this point. Absolutely. And really quick, to so all you guys out there in YouTube land, um, I know YouTube has a comment. Uh, box and stuff, and you guys definitely put your comments there. 
But for the live portion of the show, if you want to really interact, I'm always on the Mixler chat. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com forward slash the boxing voice. Spelt T-H-A-B-O-X-I-N-G-V-O-I-C-E. So uh, I know Vic frequents the uh, YouTube chat, but he doesn't ever kind of say what you guys are talking about in there. So if you want your opinions voiced on the show, uh, head on over to Mixler. Make it easier for us. One chat, one show. Vic, um, I agree with you. We have nothing to base Gary Russell on, uh, but it would have been interesting to see Louis Franco take on Gary Russell because he showed something Friday night. I still believe Fortuna won, but we all know that I'm biased, and I'm admitting it. I'm biased because I'm high on Fortuna, but he looked less than stellar. Let's put it that way. But what's up with this fucking judge, Chris Ritter, 9199? Well, didn't I mean Teddy had a bad score the other way, wasn't Teddy? Didn't he have Fortuna like ninety nine, ninety one? I mean, but it was Fortuna. I, what do you mean? I, I thought it was a competitive fight. Uh, I, I honestly had Franco winning. I, maybe Franco could have had a wider on some other scorecard, but I had a ninety six, ninety four. But I get what you're saying, ninety nine, ninety one. I mean, a lot of rounds were. I don't know how do you score a round where not much is going on in some of these rounds. Well, this is the thing, Chris Ritter was the widest score card other than Teddy Atlas, who was an unofficial scorecard. And this guy's only been judging since 2010. He's never judged any fight outside of Oklahoma. Who do you have that fight for? I think... Uh, hold on, let me check the email. Did, did he have it for... Uh, he had it for Franco, right? 99-91? There you go. So he was in the bag. But who's bad? He wasn't even the lead promoter. It was a Samson show, no? He was in the bag, dog. Uh, he was in the bag. Ninety bag, though. Who, who's bag? He wasn't in Samson's bag. Yeah, he was in uh, Franco's team. I mean, 99-91, only been judging two years, never judged out of, outside of Oklahoma. I don't know. Sounds weird. But, no, but I've seen like, scores on Twitter that were 98-92. Look, 97, I, just for Franco. I just got a text, and it was for Franco that he had that card. So, mm, something to think about. But, yeah, but a lot, uh, some folks on Twitter had it some similar to that. Some, I seen someone having 98, 92 for Franco, and uh, 97, 93 for Franco. So, I mean, maybe it wasn't that bad of a score card. I'm not, I don't know. I'm just saying I had a 96, 94. I thought Franco won. I thought he uh, landed more. Um, and at times he made Fortuna look a little wild. I don't know. He did, man. He did. That fight wasn't great, and we're spending far too much time on it. Uh, but before we get into the Kermit Cintron fight, I just want to once again give a quick shout-out to all our listeners and um, a round of applause to you guys. We definitely, definitely appreciate you guys here on the Boxing Voice. I mean, um, last Thursday's show, as Vic knows, I sent them the email that we got from Mixler. And on Mixler alone, we had 819 people. Dude, when I first started this show, I'm going to share this with you guys. When I first started this show, I set a goal that... I wanted to get to a thousand people live in five years. We don't even got two years doing this show. And that's thanks to you guys. I mean, hopefully, you know, I remember when I first started, I, I used to tell myself that if I could get a thousand people live to listen, I could call up Cyrus Radio and maybe they'll give me a time slot. Clearly, now from then, I don't believe that's possible with just a thousand. But being able to be so close to that goal um, is amazing, and it's an amazing feeling. I, I don't know how Vic feels, but for me, I'm on an all-time high because last Sunday's show was 691, so it's like every show is just increasing. And, you know, all thanks to you guys, and uh, hopefully we get syndicated, man, and we're on the big screen uh, for, for everyone's pleasure, man. That's the goal one day. 
Uh, you know, then we won't have to be begging you guys for donations. <laughs> but we got two callers here, Vic. We got uh, 413, you're live on a boxing voice, and 518, but we're going to go with 518 first. He was first. 518, where are you calling from? Yeah, it's Tony in Albany. What's going on, man? Tony in Albany. Man, it's been a while, brother. What's going on? Oh, not much, man. I just, I'm wondering, I don't want to say too much. I was just wondering on a... Twitter. I saw a beat between the Watson twins and Andre Ward. What's the, I, I, I try to figure out what it was about, but I can't. I can't seem to figure out what the genesis of that was. Vic may be the one to tell you about that. I'm I'm on Twitter very often, but if you don't at me, I don't even know what you're talking about. So Vic, did you check out the beef? Actually, Vic, before you get into With that, who? before you get into the Watson twins and Andre Ward beefing. There's actually a lot of Twitter beef going around. I got another tweet saying that Devin Alexander, Amir Khan, and Kelbrook are all beefing. I mean, what's going on? Twitter is uh, becoming the war of the words. Well, I think uh, that whole the, – the, I don't think the Watson twins are, like, the ones that were beefing with. <laughs> I think it's the parody account. I think that's what he was talking about. Um, okay. So, you know, tell from Albany, what you need to do is uh, tweet us that account, and I'll tell you because I know both the Watson twins' uh, official Twitter. So let's make sure it's the real one before we, uh, you know, start promoting. Yeah, the parody account is funny. It's funny though. The parody account is hilarious. Okay. It might have been that one. All right. All right, Tony. Well, thanks for the call, brother. All right, I'll see you next week. Four one three. You're live on the boxing voice. Who's this? Where are you calling from? What on, Mr. Irvin? Irvin, what's up? Yo, is wait, 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 wait. Is this Irvin that's always in the chat? Um, yeah, I'm not always in the chat. I listen all the time. I call like from time to time. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't confusing you with Iverson and fucking pronouncing your name wrong because you know I'm such no, a no, bad pronouncer. No, that's not me. Okay, cool. So, Irvin, what's up? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Springfield, Springfield, Mass. Nice, nice. So, what's on your mind, player? I think that, um, I clearly think that Fortuna won the fight. Um, I mean, it wasn't the greatest fight. I think that uh, you know it was a it was a letdown. Irving, I'm gonna to I'm gonna it. stop you right there. Mm -hmm. You just said you're from Massachusetts. I'm starting to hear the Dominican accent, and you no, picked Puerto Fortuna. Rican. I'm Puerto Rican. Oh damn! <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. I'm happy you you see Fortuna winning anyway, Dominican or not. No, I, I was definitely looking forward to seeing that fight, and um, I saw it. Um, I, was, I saw it on the flight back from Miami, and um, I, I thought he won the fight. You know what I'm saying? It, it, like I said, it wasn't the the most pleasing fight, especially when I was looking forward to it. But um, you know, I thought he won the fight. I, I like to see Franco again, though. I think he um, he definitely showed that you know, long layoff or not, that he he comes to fight. Um, so I definitely want to see him again. Um, the other fights, I thought that Henry Chambers looked like shit. Um, I mean, I, I don't even know how. Like you look, you have 40 professional fights, and he looked like a, like a complete amateur. Like you know, pulling his head back as an amateur. I think he just looked like shit. And I think that you know he underestimated the move going down the cruiserweight, and you know, and he paid for it. Okay. Yeah, but Min Minchu was just very good. Let's get that right out in the open. I think so. I think oh, it's yeah, very good. Uh, my, you, thing with my, my thing with Chambers is he fought like the bigger guy. Wasn't his whole claim to fame that I'm speed, I'm more athletic than these guys? Well, and It just looked like he was just standing around waiting for something to happen. I, I don't know, Vic. I disagree. I don't think he was standing around. Well, I agree with you partially. I, I agree about him fighting like the bigger man. Now, what I get from that sentence is this, that he was coming forward, making the fight, but I felt that he was doing that because Minchu wasn't giving him much. He was staying on the outside, waiting. He wanted, he wanted a counter, so Chambers had to make the fight. But again, Minchu was big, not in height, but big in body, strong, and a very good counter puncher. And he had a great, stiff jab. Irving, uh, thanks for the call. If you ever get time, give us a review on iTunes. Uh, Can I, let me um, get to ask this. you a quick, um, quick question? Yeah, go, go for it. Yeah, who do you who do you see? Um, how, how do you like the chances of Curtis Stevenson if he fights Triple G? 
Well, he's got a puncher's chance. You know, I was thinking about that this morning. I watched the fight again specifically to talk about it about you know on the show, and um, he he got good defense when he's trying to attack. You know, he he catches and shoot, which is like when he sees the right hand coming, he blocks it with his left. Yeah. And then he counters with that left, but you know, Triple G has showed us even though. I was never high on Triple G, and I needed I needed to become a believer. I am a believer in his power now, and mm-hmm. I don't know if Triple G. Let's say he throws uh, a right hand to the head. Curtis Steven blocks it. Triple G is fast enough to double up that right hand down to the body. So if he goes yeah. head body or body head, is Stevenson going to be able to get that left hook out? But I tell you what, regardless of the chances he has in this fight, it's going to be a shootout. And I'm interested, not I only that, not only that, Macklin was the first or one of, you know, the few real middleweights that Golovkin fought. But mm-hmm. Stevenson used to be a super middleweight, and after he took two years off in his last three or four fights, they've all been at middleweight. So he's coming down in weight. So fight night, he's clearly weighing more. He's strong, but he is short. But I'm interested in this fight. I mean, who else is Golovkin going to fight that's not with another promoter or that that's not with Golden Boy or Showtime? And, you know, it's just tough out there for him. So Stevenson, I think, is the best fight. Plus, he's been calling him out. You know, he said yeah, it on yeah. the telecast that Macklin fought Golovkin scared. Clearly, he's not afraid. He's from Brooklyn. He's from Brownsville. The dude has a chip on his shoulder. He's calling Golovkin out. Let's see what he does because if not, if we don't accept the Stevenson fight, what are we going to get? I think I think that's a must fight for November, and I think it's, I think it's one of those, like you said, it's going to be a shootout, and I'm definitely looking forward to it. Well, I think it's, if they pair that up with uh, Jennings and Adamick, that's a pretty good card in New York. Yeah, man, I'm oh, interested. Yeah. I'm interested. Yeah, but um, thanks for I'm taking my call, Ness. No problem, brother. Thank you for calling in, man. The show ain't the same without you guys. All right, boss. Two one three, it's your turn. You got three minutes. Seth Mitchell's due in three minutes. Go for it. Where are you calling from? All right, hey, what's up, Ness? It's me, Jose from LA, man. Called you guys a couple couple times already. Cool, cool, Jose. We're glad to hear you back, man. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. I just want to touch on a couple subjects, man. Um. Um, the topic of Amir Khan, man, we have, um, you know, Devin Alexander saying on Twitter, you know, that the fight's not happening. He doesn't know why Amir Khan is, like, saying all up on Twitter that, you know, that the fight's going to happen and all this and that, and he's deceiving the fans. And then you have Kel Brook also calling out Amir Khan, saying that, you know, this is going to be Khan's biggest payday, and plus it's, like, the biggest thing for him in the U.K. What do you, what do you think about that? Well, I think that Kell Brook is looking for a guy with a soft chin. <laughs> I'm not high on Kell Brook, but I tell you what, this fight will be a big fight in the UK. Um, it'll also be a test and a step up way up for Kell Brook, even though Khan will be moving up in weight. I'm interested in the fight. I would love to see both of those guys in the ring and, and uh, see who's the best UK Hi, John. Bum. I mean, boxer. Nah, you want to say bum, bro. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I want to see who's the best UK um boxer. Hi, John. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know, man. The way I see it is like the battle of the bums, like you say, you know, every, <laughs> every show. <laughs> hey, man, it's better when you say it than I do. I get a lot of tweets every day, bro. People think I hate Europeans. They don't know what they're talking about. I like all fighters from all over the world. I just want them all to be tested. Golovkin's been tested. I like him. Minchu, he was tested. He beat Eddie Chambers. I like yeah, him. Exactly. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? You, know you what? need to be tested to make sure that you're the real deal. We're going to let you go to free up the line for Seth Mitchell because it's 730. Uh, but definitely give us a call back if you want. All right, man. Hey, thanks a lot for having me on the show, man. And everybody, mark that application, man. That Mixler, review the iTunes, man. Give these guys their shine. Come on, man. Don't hate. Congratulate. Uh, thank you, brother. 
240, I believe this is Seth. Is this Mr. Mayhem himself? Yes, sir. What's happening, brother? Seth, first things first, uh, I got to eat my crow. I, I got to be a, a man and tell you I picked against you both times. I was right once. You made me a believer the second time. You showed different levels to your game. It wasn't the best performance for fans. I'll, I'll be honest. You know, they didn't react to that fight probably how you would have wanted, but you got the W, which is the most important thing. How did you feel that night? I mean, clearly I know because I was there. We were, you know, I probably asked you this at the press conference, but for those that weren't there, what was the feeling for Seth Mitchell after overcoming his lone loss? Um, I, felt, I felt good. You know, I had a lot happening in my life during that time. Uh, my main focus was to go out there and, and, and get the W, and uh, that's what I did. And, I, you know, I'm used to, you know, running running through my opponents, and uh, I knew it wasn't the most, you know, fan-friendly fight, but at the same time, Styles made fights. And with uh, Jonathan Banks, I was happy with my – not satisfied, but happy with my performance because I had a game plan, and I stuck to my game plan. I knew that Jonathan Banks didn't do a lot of punches. He's a great counterpuncher, and I knew my jab was – just as good or better than him, and if he was going to let me win the fight with my jab, then uh, that's what I was going to do because the bottom line was I needed to win that fight. And, uh, you know, I'm back on, you know, Showtime in, in another month, and without that victory, I wouldn't be back on Showtime. So, you know, I, I was happy with my performance, uh, not satisfied because I, watching the fight, I thought it was a you know a good technical fight, but there were spots where I, where I could have done more at the same time. You know, he was a counterpuncher, and... Uh, I just did what I had to do to win the fight. Now, Seth, I remember asking you after the first loss, and, and you would tell me you knew you were better than Jonathan Banks. And you proved that in this win. But what gave, I mean, was that something just in you, that, you know, that drives Seth Mitchell, or, or did you really know you were better than him and you seen the mistakes that you made? And so that's why you felt that way. I really knew I was a better fighter than what I showed that night. When I went and watched the first fight, even though I, I was winning the entire fight until I got knocked down, I was making so many mistakes, lunging, reaching, and, you know, just being overly aggressive, too much offense, not thinking defense at all. And um, at this at this level, you know, I know that I can't continue to do that. So I just had to, you know, go back to the drawing board in the gym and work on those things and then the acronym that I made up for that fight was P-Bad, patience, balance, and distance. And I wanted to bring that into the fight. Uh, I think Jonathan Banks is a is a good fighter. You know, he's a good counterpuncher. He's, he's probably a better boxer, you know, really than I am. But, you know, I knew I had a better game plan that I needed to bring to the table. And I knew I, I wasn't using all of the, my attributes that God has given me, such as my, my jab, you know, my athleticism. And um, I had power, you know, in both of my hands. So I just, if I brought all that to the table, I just, didn't think that um, Jonathan Banks could beat me in the rematch. Oh, you definitely proved that. But, Seth, now the question that I want to ask you is, I'm a bit of a conspiracy theorist, you know what I mean? And, and I, yeah. I spoke about my theory with, uh, you know, some of the guys in your camp and whatnot. This is my thing. It's not necessarily a theory. It's just something that I don't understand. I and mean, I want to see how you feel about this. You got... Yourself and Chris Ariola coming into the September 6th fight, which is going to be the biggest fight of your career, the biggest name. He's a marquee name in the heavyweight division. He's fought against the Klitschko. He's fought against, you know, Thomas Adamick. He's been in there with the names. He's been on HBO. This is going to give you that, I guess, crossover fame maybe or more fame because of the name. But what I don't get is both of you guys are signed to Al Heyman. Both of you guys are ranked in the WBC very high. And then you got Bermaine Stevenson, who is the mandatory for Vitaly. Vitaly is basically on the fence about retiring or not, or not. So if I'm Al Heyman, I don't put both of my guys in the same ring. Instead, I say, all right, Seth, you fight Bermaine in case Vitaly, you know, retires. You you fight for the vacant title for with Bermaine. If you lose... 
we can get Areola to do a rematch, and the Al Heyman camp still has two opportunities and a chance to have a WBC heavyweight champion. I'm getting the feeling this is a cash out. Now, before you answer, I don't necessarily feel that the cash out is on you. Instead, I think it's Areola because we're going to go past Areola. He, he lost to Vitaly, so he can't beat Vitaly. And if he can't beat Vitaly, you're not beating Vladimir. I know style makes fights, but those guys are basically twins. Then he lost to Adamic, and Bermain Stevenson really put it on him. Now, for you... You just have the one loss, but you did show vulnerability in your last three fights, and Areola is a big puncher. So I can see how some may think they're cashing out on you, putting you in with the big puncher, but I just don't see how Al Heyman would do that when Areola's the one that has lost. Areola's the one that's having trouble making weight ever since he started boxing. Areola's not as, I guess, outspoken well he is outspoken but he's not as well spoken as you you're the american dream football star turned boxing you know contender you just got your first uh nabf title i mean what's your thoughts what do you think about this fight is this just two good boxers getting in the ring or is there more to this um i mean i would I wouldn't necessarily say that there's more to it. Uh, I understand the, the 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 politics and the business of boxing, and like you said before, even though you know I've won two out of my last three fights, uh, my armor in the eyes of in the eyes of the public and eyes of the boxing people, my armor may have been a little bit tarnished because I've you know been hurt days in those in those last uh, in my last three fights. So. You know, I, I think at this point in my career, I need a fight with a, a big name. And um, Chris Ariola is a big name. We just so both happen to be signed with Al Heyman. And um, make no mistakes about it. This is a fight, actually, that I, I, I don't talk a lot. I don't, you know, go on Twitter and interviews and, you know, call out names. But I believe in myself, and this is a fight that I actually wanted a year ago. It just never happened. It never you know, came out in the public eye because I, you know, I'm not a, a, a Twitter or Facebook thug or anything like that. I, but it's a fight that I want, and it's a fight that I'm going to win. I'm very confident that I'm going to win. I'm very confident that this fight is not going to the scorecard. Chris Ariola talks a lot. Um, you know, he's just going to continue to talk, and I'm going to continue to prepare and prepare for him. And for on the sixth, I, I will be victorious. There's no doubt in my mind that I'm not going to win this fight. It just so happened that. Both of us are Al Heyman fighters, but um, I think it's a it's a good fight. It's a good fight for the fans, but uh, you know I'm gonna be ready, man. Trust and believe I will be ready on the six, and uh, I'm gonna win this fight hands down. Well, that's a great answer, Vic. It's on you. Hey, Seth. Uh, going back to the Jonathan Banks fight, uh, what was different in this fight than the first fight? I mean, it seemed like. That Jonathan Banks, you know, he every time he kind of landed on you, kind of hurt you, but then he would back off. Um, what did you see different in him this time? You said, "What did I see different?" Or how, yeah, like, well, how was this fight much more different than the first one? This fight was different because I just I was more patient. You know, I'm a very by my nature is I'm gonna go get it. I'm very aggressive. You know, I'm I'm always a bull. When I'm when I'm in the ring, when I played football, you know I was a downhill linebacker, plug that hole, you know stopping people at the line of scrimmage. That's just my nature. When I compete, that's just how I am. Very aggressive in nature. But looking at the first fight, you know sometimes hell, I, I can you can't be that way, especially with somebody that's just waiting for you to make your mistakes. Donald Banks had tons of experience, way more experience than me, and uh, he was just waiting for me to make my mistakes open up. You know when I when I throw five or six punches just waiting for the counter and that was you know what I didn't do in the second fight. If you see me I knew when he dropped his hands and you know when he was just trying to lure me in and uh, sometimes the crowd would boo because you know I wouldn't oh he's dropping his hand you should go in there and try to take his head off but that's when he's setting his trap. And so I just said, Okay, I'm winning around. If you drop your hands you come to me and he did and when he tried to come to me I would back up 
and he just you know, he didn't take the initiative to come to me. So I made him be the bull, and I basically was the matador, and I just outboxed him. And this fighter was just we took it round by round, win win as many rounds as you can, and uh, you know I believe I won eight to nine rounds out of a twelve round fight. But my patience was the key. My patience and my jab was the key in that fight. Now a lot has been said behind the scenes on Twitter regarding that fight that, you know, with different Jonathan Banks, and this and this and that. And some people even mentioned that the fight with you and him was fixed. I mean, have you heard any of that chatter? And what do you say to something like that? I mean, I, I don't know nothing about no fight being fixed, so I don't, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't bother me at all. You know, people say he wasn't all throwing any punches. If you watch boxing and you watch Jonathan Banks, he doesn't throw a lot of punches in this fight anyway. We knew that going into the fights. We studied him and some he might throw 20 punches around which is you know not a lot of punches at all so it wasn't just you know that uh he didn't throw punches and also you have to remember he knew he, he, who, who he was in the ring with i mean i can punch so he didn't want to you know run in there and get caught with anything either it was just the fact that i wasn't as aggressive as i usually am i just sat back and i, I wanted him to be the bull and he didn't and he, he lost the fight but it doesn't bother me man my, my main thing is train hard and go in there and get the victory, and that's what I did, and I'm on, on to the next one. That's from it's Chris Ariola. Now, talking about Chris Ariola, uh, it's a fight that, you know, it has interest from American fans. Um, Chris may not come into shape, um, but what do you see in Chris that might pose problems for you? I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, a lot of people are saying this is a cash-out fight. I don't know which way it's going, but what do you see in Chris that poses the biggest challenge to you? Um, he, I mean, obviously, he throws a lot of punches. He he comes for it, and, uh, you know, he has good size. You know, he's going to – I don't know exactly how tall he is. They got him listed at 6'4". I don't know if he's if he's really 6'4", but he's probably at least my height, I would say, and uh, we'll probably weigh about the same about the same uh, weight. But um, he throws a lot of punches, and um, he's aggressive. So anytime you're in the ring with a heavyweight that, you know, comes forward and lets his, lets his hands go, you know, there's always danger. But – uh. Whatever he comes to the table with, we'll be prepared. Like I said, I'm just continuing to work on my defense, continuing to get better. I learned a lot since November 17th, my first fight against Jonathan Banks. And um, the best has, has yet to come. I'm just continuing to get better. But, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not worried about, about this fight. I'm not worried about it being, you know, in his backyard. And once thing, everybody keeps saying Chris Ariola, every time Chris Ariola has stepped up, he's lost. Whenever he's fought somebody on even playing field, he's lost. He's done nothing spectacular. He lost to Vitaly. He lost to Adamick, and he lost to Romain Steve. Whenever there's an even playing field, he's lost. Like, Chris Ariel, he can, he's a good fighter, but, you know, he, he talks all. He, he keeps running his mouth, but I'm going to be getting that ass on the six. Now, is this fight a little more personal to you? Because there's been times where, you know, him and his trainer are taking shots at you, that they're building you up when you're on HBO as the next big thing, and you really weren't that great. I mean, that, those were uh, Henry Ramirez's words. Is it a little more personal for you because they took shots at you when you were coming up on HBO? I mean, that's just that's just hate. That's just, they, they just envy. You know, I mean, he had his opportunity. He's been on HBO. He's done his thing. I don't say anything bad about any opponent. I don't hate on any opponent because, like I said, what they eat doesn't make me shit. You know, if I if I hate on them, you know, blessings are not going to come my way. But every time he does an interview, my name is in his mouth. He always has my name in his mouth. So, you know, he's going to get it. Everything that he's saying, he's going to get his opportunity to back it up on the stick. And, you know, hopefully he can do that. But, uh, you know, he, he just knows he's... I, he, I hope he knows he's going to be in a fight. I hope he knows that. Now, Seth, being that this fight is on Showtime, um, you know, basically Golden Boy has been working with Showtime exclusively ever since HBO said, you know, Golden Boy is not wanted here anymore. And these guys, the Klitschko's, they all have, you know, they have the belts, and most of their last fights have been on HBO. Does it concern you that maybe when you get to that level, the drama between HBO and Golden Boy and Showtime might not cause you to fight a Klitschko for a world title? Uh, honestly, right now, I, ha I haven't been thinking about that. You know, I, I try not to. It it's hard. Sometimes it's hard when you're on the path and you keep winning, you know, to not look look ahead. But I try not to, you know, look, look ahead, especially in this fight. This is a big fight for me. And um, so the only thing that's on my mind right now is uh, taking care of 
of Chris Ariola on the six. I haven't really thought about that, the question that you just asked. That's understood. That's understood. Uh, and my final question um, before Ness jumps back in, there's another guy in your stable that also is managed by Al Heyman, and his name is Deontay Wilder. Uh, he's got that one-punch knockout power, and later down the road, that might be a big fight. I mean, what are your opinions on Deontay Wilder? I think Deontay Wilder's a, a, a good fight. He's tall, and like you say, anytime you have that, that one-punch power, that's always that ace in the hole, so he definitely has that. Um, I think he's athletic, but, um, you know, I think if, if me and him lock horns, I think that'd be a good fight as well. You know, I'm not... One thing, if you look at my record, I don't, I've never said no to an opponent that my stable, my team has um, has mentioned to me. I, I I don't duck anybody. I don't run from anybody. You know, I, if you look, even if you look at my last, this, this being my fifth fight coming up, you got Timor, you got Jonathan, you had uh, Chaz Wilson, Jonathan Mays, Jonathan Banks, and Ariola. I, so I'm fighting, you know, quality opposition and, it doesn't matter to me whether it's the same promotional company, same advisor. It doesn't matter. As long as it makes sense, we can get it in. Well, Seth, speaking of uh, Deontay Wilder, we had him on the show Thursday, and uh, he's actually picking you to win this fight. He basically said everything you just said in terms of Ariola and all the times that he stepped up and failed. And he, I actually, you know, gave him my whole spiel on the uh, cashing out, and he feels that they're cashing out on Ariola uh, because he hasn't been able to, you know, win those top tier fights. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, come September 6, it's going to be no different uh, between you and him. But um, I really want to know what, what's your thoughts? It's in terms of how this fight is going to look. I mean, is there any pressure because of the last fight not being as exciting as you wanted, or uh, are you taking the same approach and the win is the win? Oh, I mean, I, I, even in the last fight, I, I mean, I didn't, I want to put on exciting fights, but at the same time, you know, I knew that was a, a must-win fight, but styles make fights. As a, people that know boxing, they, they, they realize that styles make fights, and Jonathan Banks, he's a, you know, he's, he's a count, he just waits, he doesn't throw a lot of punches, and he's a counter puncher. And um, I figured I would just beat him with my jab. But Ariola, I know Ariola, he's not going to outbox me. And he's a, he's a brawler. So and Ariola is, if Ariola was losing the fight like Jonathan Banks was losing the fight, he would have, I, I would think that he's going to press me. You know what I'm saying? And he, he comes to fight. Ariola comes to fight. He's a fan friendly fighter. He's going to let his hands go. So I think it's going to be an, an exciting fight. But uh, whatever. If, if he wants to bang, we can bang, and if he wants to box, we can box. But like I said, man, I'm very confident. Ariel, he's not going to win this fight. He can talk. Him and his trainer, they can say whatever they want to say. It's going to be me and Ariel in that ring, and he's not going to be victorious. Well, Seth, I'll tell you one thing. Um, before you go ahead and give out any social media where all these fans listening and uh, those that listen to the podcast after we're not live, can follow you and get closer to Seth Mayhem Mitchell and the camp. I want to tell you, I like this new Seth Mitchell. I, you know, I like the curses. I like the uh, the aggression. And, and, and I don't know, it seems like you're taking a different approach. I don't know if it's because it's something personal between you and Ariola or the fact that Ariola talks about you in his interviews. But whatever it is, I like it. Uh, you can check out the chat for yourself. They clearly like it. Um, you know, we hope that, that that same fire that you have in this interview transcends into the fight September 6th. Uh, so go ahead and give out your social media. Uh, that will be on Twitter, Seth Mayhem 48 and on Facebook, just Seth Mitchell. All right, Seth. Well, thanks for coming on the show, man, and we wish you all the best of luck. Uh, thank you very much, man. appreciate y'all. We appreciate you. Vic. Um, we've, we've had Seth Mitchell quite a few times. I mean, uh, this is, sounds like a new Seth Mitchell or a motivated Seth Mitchell. Is that going to mean something on fight night? Vic? Vic, I think you muted yourself. 
Sorry, yeah, what I was saying, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the question would always be Seth Chin when it comes to a fight like this. Uh, you know, Chaz Witherspoon rocked him. Jonathan Banks KO'd him. So, I mean, if Chris lands, which he probably will, I mean, how will Seth react? And if Chris lands flush, Chris can go in and finish him off. I mean, it, it, it's all of who, what you think is going to happen. And, uh, like, Mitchell's going to be the one in better shape. But at the end of the day, Chris probably has the better skill. Per se, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it all depends on Seth's chin. That's that's what it's going to come down to in this fight. Well, I'll play devil's advocate um, and ask you this: Who was Ariola knocked out? Good question. But um, you know, I you, um, I I don't know, man. But on that note. He's a maniac, man. It's Amelia, it's, it's Amelia, Amelia is running wild like he's never ran before. The oh, BX yeah. Zone, Boogie Down yeah, Sean yeah. in the building. <laughs> What's going on, fellas? Man, we just happy to have you back, dude. It, it ain't the same when I can't play that intro. Yeah, man, you know, I try to call, I'm on Thursday and... You know, I don't know, you were slaking, man. You kind of, um, I don't know what was going on with the... Uh, you know, the calling line, but it wasn't letting me. So I said, all right, you know, these guys uh, don't want that. No, no, no maniac on today. Nah, but I'm man, here. Never, dude. Never. We want you on all the nah. time, brother. Nah, I know. I know. You know, you know, I'm just kidding, man. So what's good, man? What's on the mind of the maniac? Well, you know, you, you probably already spoke about this, but I, I, I'm going to bring it back and um, speak about Curtis Stevens. And, um, you know, he's, he's a fighter that I've been wanting him to get in the ring with Triple G for, for numerous reasons. Um, Triple G, obviously, is the more seasoned fighter, you know, more technically sound, and, of course, to be the favorite. But Curtis Stevens has two things that Triple G hasn't faced in a while. A fighter that's not going to be intimidated. Because all these fighters, they they already believe all fighting Triple G. They they you see it in their face. They they already know they lost. That that that's already bad thing. That's one and two. He has the power. He has the power to make Triple G respect him. Now does Triple G run through that left hook? We don't know. And that's what makes this fight interesting, that Curtis Stevens is going to come in and say, I don't care what people say about you. I'm going to come and bring it to you. Now, whether Curtis Stevens wins or not, hey, but I'll tell you this, you know, win, lose, or draw, we're going to say, yo, Curtis Stevens looked better than every fighter that Triple G has fought. And the, the last fighter, Chalice, ran numerous shots against Triple G was Gabe Rosado, and I like Rosado, but let's be honest here, even he was on his bike from the opening bell. You know, he looked at Timmy and still landing shots against Triple G. So just imagine if he stood stood his ground a little bit and said, yo, F this, man, I, I'm, I'm going to fight you a little bit. But obviously that wasn't the case. Triple G, you know, it just got like samurai swords in them gloves, man. Just He just, when he hits you, it's like he just opens up a cut and then, that's it. Like when the shark smells blood. Absolutely, man. Um, the only, till date, in my eyes, the only guy that gave Triple G a good fight was Rosado. Yes, he did, and that's, but that's what I'm saying. And if you look at the fight, he was on his bike. He wasn't there to say, yo, come on, let's fight. And it kind of it kind of shocked me. But he still was the one that, if you look at his last four fights, the one that was most competitive. Now, when I say competitive, not in the way where the fight was competitive, where Triple, I mean, Gabe Rosado looked like, you know, he looked competitive because the fight was one-sided, obviously. You know, but, you know, he's so hard. And I think Curtis Stevens is going to be the fighter that he will land. He'll be a fighter that will land a lot of shots on Triple G. And he'll be willing at times to exchange. Now, can he take Triple G's power? I don't know. 
I mean, obviously, all the good boys are going to say, no, you crazy. He kills Curtis Stevens in two seconds, you know. I mean, well, these Triple G yeah. fans is above. They had you. They, you they just, right now, they'll say Triple G beats Jesus Christ in two rounds. Ask them. Like, well, in it's, the it's chat, in the chat, they're saying people, Ryan Bivens, shout out to Ryan Bivens from uh, Sweet Box and Videos. Even though after I gave you a personal tweet, you ain't even say thanks, but you're still my boy because you're the one-stop shop for all boxing fights if you can't catch it on the, you know, Showtime HBO or Box Nation, whatever. You got them all. Uh, you suck for that. But anyway, Ryan Bivens says... People got it twisted. They think if you stand your ground against Golovkin, it's actually going to help. But it's not. You'll just get knocked out quicker. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I mean, I see what he's saying because the power is there. So if you're not moving, you're easier to hit. And if this guy hits as hard as we think he hits, he's going to get you out quicker. I can see that. But in Stevenson's, Stevens' case, rather, because it's not Stevens' son, in Stevens' case blocks fairly well and i see a lot of guys in the chat talking this jesse brinkley shit but man how many fighters have we seen take a loss and come back and rebuild and be good i mean yeah, yeah that's corny I'm, I'm tired of people always bringing up all of what happened when listen man nobody cares about that you understand nobody look at soto Karras. mv2 hold on hold on example. sean mv2 says golovkin has an iron chin Who's hit him on that chin? That, let's see, the, let's see that, Stevens. That's you, man. Let's see These Stevens hit G Golovkin, fans. and Golovkin they, not go down. Then we say he has an iron chin. I'm not saying he's not gonna beat Stevens. I'm saying let's see him hit. Let's see him hit. It's the same thing with Lucas Matisse. You know, Triple G fans and Lucas fans are, are the same. They very delusional. You know, they, they just seen what they see now, but who name name one fighter that Lucas Matisse or Triple G fought. Then we say, yo, damn, if this dude touches chin, it could be a problem. Exactly, my point. Now, I'm not taking nothing from these fighters before these people in the chat start crying. Because, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you got to get in there and defend Lucas, yourself, Sean. So far, so far, you know, they, they, they look like the real, the real deals, but we know for sure... Lucas Chin will be tested in a couple of weeks. Um, and we also know that if Triple G fights Stevens, his chin is going to be, you know, definitely um, tested in that fight. And we just want to see, I just want to see these fighters tested before we can really say, okay, because nowadays fans, they see a fighter knock two, three fighters out in a row on HBO Showtime. He's a beast. Look at Berto when he was beating up. All these Coquito and Piragua guys, you know, blimpy managers. Oh, Berto, Berto, everybody was jumping on Berto. Then he finally stepped up against Calazzo, and we said, wait a minute, Berto who? And ever since, every fight since then, he just didn't look good. Yeah, he beat Quintana. You know, he's, he's just, you know, bad. And then he, he ended up beating Zavik in a good fight, which got stopped because of cut. So... People need to let these fighters prove themselves more. You understand? Sergio is obviously the number one fighter at 160. And, and people got the nerve to say Triple G is the best 160 pounder. That's, that's, that's absurd. That's ridiculous. Hey, Sean. How did I disrespect Sergio? Hey, Sean, Chemo says that's exactly what you're doing now, Sean. Stevenson, well, he really meant Steven, Stevens. Stevens. Yeah, no, no, he spelled Stevenson, but he really meant Stevens KO the bum, and you want to feed him the Triple G. But he has power, is what I'm saying. That's what I'm and saying. I don't he know, has I don't power. Know if I would call well, he Saul bums, Roman. but he's showing power. All right, these, all the other fighters before that wasn't showing that power. Rosado wasn't showing one-punch power. He showed power, but not one-punch power. You understand? The same thing with Macklin. Stevenson is known for a power puncher. That's just how he's been. Once again, I'm not saying that Stevens beats a Triple G. He'll still be a, a, a big underdog in that fight. You understand? But what I'm saying is it's a fighter that we're going to say, yo, damn, boy, he came to bring you the Triple G. And he's probably 
a fighter that'll open up other fighters' eyes and say, wait a minute, I could beat this guy. Because it always happens like that. Same thing with Margarito, same thing with Paul Williams, you know, even Sergio Martinez at one time was a fighter not too many fighters wanted to get in the ring with. And right now, Triple G is one of them. Until somebody exposes him, even if they lose, then you'll see it. But So then that happens, we won't know. But I'm not going to have my pom-poms out for Triple G like, you know, everybody else is. You understand? He got to show me more. I hear you. Sean, I'm going to get ahead and get to another call. Um, Vic, no problem, before I man. do that, uh, what's your thoughts? I mean, I know Triple G's your guy. What do you think about the Stevens fight? Should it happen? Are you happy if it does happen? Well, I mean, what other options does he have at this present moment? Um, Quillen's on another network. Martin Murray already said no after you know talking a big game. Now he said no. Uh, who else is out there? Daniel Gale already dodged him. Darren Barker's promoter already said that fight wasn't going to happen. So, I mean, I guess, what else is there? What, what else can we do? All right. I mean, if you, if you, if you pair that up, if you pair that up with Jennings Adamick, I, I won't be mad at that at all. Jennings Adamick, Jennings. Oh, yeah, they're talking about that? Yeah, they're talking about that for November. You know, we didn't get to that fight yet because we were still on ESPN, but... Adamick looked a lot better, but again, it was versus Dominic Gwynn. I mean, how long has Dominic Gwynn been fighting right. and losing? Right. Um, two one three, you're live. What's up? Hey man, thanks for having me back, man. Um, so yeah, so this, who's this? this is this seldom seen, the big, man? Um, you know, who's... this is big, like like maniac. I don't know, I forgot his name, man, but you know, the maniac, the machine. But anyways, man, what I'm trying to say is, you know, I don't know what what, what is the, the the whole idea of people thinking, you know, that maybe Sergio's trying to duck Triple G, or or trying to put obstacles because I I heard um, that you know they're trying to put Curtis Stevens as like an obstacle for Triple G in order to face Sergio Martinez later on in the future, but, you know, everybody's saying right now that maybe um, Sergio's trying to just, like, hold it out just for a minute, maybe try to see if, um, to see the outcome of maybe uh, Floyd and uh, Canelo and maybe see if he can get a shot at the big payday compared to, like, probably getting less money, probably tarnishes um, his belt and get, get stripping, you know, and then, um, you know, Triple G's the new crown, you know. What do you guys, what is uh, your opinion on that, Vic, and that's, well, my, my thing is, Sergio has said he, he would fight Triple G in 2014. But then, you know, after the fight, uh, Lou DiBella was like, no, that's not that fight's not happening, blah, blah, blah. After the Macklin uh, Triple G fight. And then today, Samson says that, uh, oh, yeah, after you beat Stevens, then maybe you can fight. Who is Samson to tell Triple G who he has to fight to get, uh, to, to get Sergio Martinez? I mean, really? Triple G is the guy standing in front of... Uh, in front of a Sergio Martinez Triple G fight. Come on. You mean you mean Stevens? Yeah, yeah. Stevens is the one standing in front of a Triple G Martinez fight. I don't know. I don't know. What, what do you think? Me. <clears throat> I don't even care. That's what I'm saying. I like the fight. There's nothing else out there for him. Let's say let's just let's just do it real quick, Vic. I mean, go to the rankings. Go to our rankings real quick. Who's in the middleweight division that's available? I'm going to say some names. You check the rankings to make sure I didn't miss any. Daniel Gill, Darren Barker, they're in a fight. He beat Macklin. Sergio Martinez is hurt. Peter Quillen is with... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Peter Quillen is with Golden Boy. Uh, Hassan Nick Dam, but we've seen him lose badly to Peter Quillen. But that's a good fight. I won't turn that fight away. I want to say he lost badly. I think he held his own, even though he got knocked down like a hundred. Yeah, but if times. he got dropped six times versus Quillen, he'll probably get knocked out by Golovkin, right? I mean, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I think Triple G will finish the job. Felix Stern, he doesn't want any of Golovkin. He vacated the title. I mean, he ducked him. Then he lost the title to Gil. Gil vacated the title. So whether he was fighting or not, he doesn't want any. Who's left? Chavez. Pretty much. Chavez, they're not gonna put Chavez in there I mean, with now, my boy, uh, my boy Loki uh, in the chat keeps saying Mark and Marco Antonio Rubio. <laughs> yeah, but, that fight bad as look, well. Look, 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 look. 
I'll be honest. I'll accept Rubio because Rubio has faced some top fighters. But the thing with the Rubio fight is, if he wins, we're going to say, so what? It was Rubio. <laughs> but it, but is that the same thing you're going to say when he beat Stevens or if he beat Stevens? But Stevens has that it factor. He has the power. He has a chance. Rubio doesn't. Rubio ain't knocking him out. Rubio's yeah, last man, knockout it, was versus the dude yeah, from we beat, Canada. Uh, and that's he knocked it. Out, he knocked out David Lemieux. I mean, the dude from Canada. I mean, Sal Roman and David Lemieux. I mean, no, I don't no, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, Saul, Saul Roman has been in with everybody. David Lemieux has not. Saul Roman's been, and this is just off the top of my head. Vanez, Uma, uh, who else? He just got knocked out by Stevenson. I mean, he's been, look up his name. He's been in there with top names. Lemieux went in there with a mediocre name in Rubio and got wiped out. Can't nah, come on, man, no way. I don't know. I think I think this knockout. I mean, while it was a great knockout, while it was a highlight reel, it's getting a little overrated, in my opinion. Again, I don't Definitely. disagree with you. I could play devil's advocate with you. I mean, who is Stevenson be? I mean, who is Saul Roman? You know, he's 150. You keep saying Stevenson, they're gonna think you're talking about Adonis Stevens. No, man. who is Stevens? He. He just fought Saul Roman. Saul Roman's 154 pounder, to be honest. Let's just keep that 100, because that's what we do best here. Um, now, who else did he beat? Edwin Alaya? Edwin Alaya was nobody. He, he's always lost. He was always a fringe ESPN type of guy. David Lemieux beat Edwin Alaya, if I'm not wrong. Check that out. I think I he mean, did. Yeah, I and, and, and the last fight, who'd he fight? Brinkley? No, 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 not Brinkley. Finley. I mean, J. Leon Love beat Finley better than him. So, you're absolutely right. Stevens is not a world beater. He's not going to be the guy that's going to ice Golovkin. But there's a possibility because of the power. There's no one else in the division that's available that we can even say that. At least this is a gamble. You know, you put him in yeah. with Rubio, you know it's just a showcase. <laughs> Rubio's old. Let's be honest. Now, now man, Yo. I, want, I wanted to keep uh, to, to, to the subject of uh, Chavez Jr., you know, that he didn't want to be uh, Who do you think that they're probably going to, um, you know, try to build him up? Uh, do you think they're going to try to build him up from the ground up and try to rebuild all those fans once again? From well, I'll Luke, be honest Luke, with you. They don't got to do much rebuilding in terms of fan base. His name is Chavez. There's only yeah. one Chavez. When you think of great Mexican fighters, Julio Cesar Chavez's name is always going to be brought up. So his son's always yeah. going to get fame from that. And as far as where does he go, we really can't do anything but guesstimate because of the fact that we don't even know what weight this dude's going to fight at. I mean, he's going to fight Vera at 165. We don't know if he's ever going to be able to well, make it. It's 168 yeah. now. Oh, look at that. Now it's 168, so we don't even know, is he going to make weight again to be fighting a Golovkin or not? So, you know, we really can't answer that. But I got to get to another caller. Thanks for calling in again. You're Black Ski Mask Joe, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Shout out to you, man. Thanks for always <laughs> listening and supporting to the show. 201, you're yeah. live on the Boxing Voice. Who's this? Hey, what's up? It's Jersey Seth. Hey, what's up, and, uh, Jersey I'd like Seth? I say, uh... As always, you guys do uh, a great job. Uh, it's the best uh, boxing podcast out there. Um, but I Thank you, man. To now, all you got to do now, all you got to do now yeah. is go and write that on iTunes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll definitely take the time out to do that for sure. But um, I wanted to touch on a few subjects. Number one, uh, you know, as everybody knows, uh, Ness, you, you like the Showtime and uh, Victor, the HBO guy or whatever, but I just want to make a comment about that. Ever since this top rank uh, Golden Boy beef has been going on, um, I believe that both uh, um, networks have been doing an excellent job in their boxing. Uh, at the beginning of the year, HBO uh, picked it up very nice with Fight State Provide call from Bradley and the, the Brandon Mios match with uh, Alvarado, and then um, the second half, now Golden Boy has been picking it up with Lamont Peterson and Lucas Matisse and uh, uh, all these other fights that are happening now. So 
So I, I just want to give a, a, a big shout out to both networks. I think they've been uh, picking it up over the past uh, year and a half, and boxing in general has been going on the upside and it shows. And uh, my other thing is, uh, Cintron, I, I, I saw the ESPN fight last night, and I, I fell asleep before the Fortuna fight, but <laughs> I saw Cintron's fight, and uh, he looked a lot better than he did in the last fight, but at the end of the day, he gives a shit. He should retire. <laughs> uh, and Marty Rosen versus Andre, I can't wait till that fight happens. I think that's a good fight. I'm having a problem uh, picking the winner. And uh, Ness, you're probably going to get pissed at me, but I just got to be real with you. Uh, I noticed that you're a Figueroa fan. I'm sorry, man, but that guy's a bum, man. That guy's, mm, that guy's a bum. I, I, he's fun to watch, but that guy's a bum. I'm sorry. And, and that's all I had to say. Damn. Great call, man. Great call. Thanks for calling in, brother. Uh, I, you know, we're we going to have to agree to disagree, but great call. Nope. My bad. Vic. Um, damn, why are they hating on Figueroa so bad? <laughs> I knew you were going to get mad at that. <laughs> anyway, Kermit Cintron defeated Jonathan Batista by 10-round unanimous decision. But much like the last caller says, who gives a fuck? It's, mm -hmm. it's time to hang him up, man. Ugh. All right, so we'll move along to the fight card that really mattered because I thought it was going to be the other way around. I thought the ESPN fight card was going to be the shit because of Javier Fortuna. He turned out looking like shit. But NBC Sports Network uh, out there in Connecticut, you know, we, we've already talked about Curtis Stevens defeating Saul Roman in one round with a, with a mean left hook. Vic feels like we're overrating it. So we're going to move on to the fight that was more of a chess match. Uh, between Dabisco Minchu uh, defeating Eddie Chambers, a veteran that's been in with many names. And now that I say Eddie Chambers, I just want to go ahead and put out my disclaimer and apology to all the listeners, everyone who's tweeted at me. I do apologize. I was wrong. Dimitrenko was never a cruiserweight. You can stop killing me about it. <laughs> I am human. I am entitled to make mistakes. Jesus. You know, but anyway, Eddie Chambers, dude, with all the skill, fast Eddie, he didn't look good, Vic, and he lost badly to a guy that was 12 in nine. But, but he's another player now in the cruiserweight division, and he's a a fighter from another country that I can say was tested because he fought a vet. And not an old fading vet, a pretty good vet. A vet that just beat a Demick with one hand and got robbed on the scorecards. But this time, there was no robbery. And this South African... <laughs> Minchu gets the South African song of the day for putting on a great fight, man. I really like his style, Vic. I mean, he was really... Parrying shots. He kind of has his own rendition of the Mayweather defense, does he not? He kind of leans on his back foot. He's using the the, 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 the the same kind of shoulder roll, but he's so stocky. It probably went past a lot of fight um, fight fans' minds. But he really does use the, the, the shoulder roll. He just doesn't keep that left hand. Well, well, he was a southpaw, right? Yeah, so he doesn't keep that right hand too high to his chin like a, a, a Mayweather shoulder roll, but... Regardless of whatever the defense is called, it worked. He put on a great job, and he looked good. I want to see him again. What about you? Well, my, my thing, here's a disclaimer. Uh, Mali Bangwe didn't call in. He should be calling in after his his cousin beat Eddie Chambers this weekend. Yeah, uh, he barely sleep. But, I mean, I, I don't know about Eddie Chambers, man. Like, when he's against those bigger guys, he's a little faster. Now, now that he had a shed pounds and he's got to fight guys – that might be just as fast as him. That might be just as athletic as him at this weight class. Like he's in, he's there. There is no middle division for him now. Like there is no, you know, it's either heavyweight or cruiserweight. And from what we've seen at cruiserweight, you know, he might be too slow for cruiserweight. I'm not saying he is. You know, he did have a long layoff, so maybe that factored into it. But I mean, he's too big. He he's too small to go up to heavyweight and actually, you know, test the guys like the Klitschko's. You know, I, I don't know if he can 
make a career out of fighting other guys. I'm, I'm pretty sure he could fight like the guys like Pavek and all these other guys. But obviously, he's too small for the Klitschko. Now, is he too slow for cruiserweight? I mean, what do you think of that? I don't know. I really, you know, we both picked him to win. We didn't know much about Minchu. I mean, look. Was he ever exciting, though? Like, were you ever happy or excited to see an Eddie Chambers fight? I mean, he wasn't exciting, but you could see that he had, I don't know. I, I don't know what to think. I, I think, was it his best fight versus Pavekin? Who? Or was it Hellenius? I know he fought one of those Euro guys in I don't know, but, but Ryan Bivis makes a good point. It, it, it was his timing. Uh, it, you're absolutely right. But he did, I don't know, he did look a little slower, and he did look like the bigger man. Um, he fought like the bigger man is what I'm trying to say. But you know what else it could be, Vic? The whole Southpaw Orthodox fighter thing. The jab couldn't land. Maybe it was because he was throwing it at a Southpaw. I mean, I don't know, man. It just, he can't, you know, his, his, his marquee punch is the jab. Like, that's how he wins fights with the jab, but... He really wasn't able to use it. Like, he tried, but it it just couldn't land. It was weird, man. But Ryan Bivens, um, if you want, give him a call because you watch that division more than anybody. Let us know something about Minshew. Did he get lucky, or is he really going to be a player in the Cruiserweight division? Because I know you watch all those guys in that Cruiserweight division. But we have spent enough time on those two guys. Let's move forward to Thomas Ademek. Uh, beating Dominic Gwynn for unanimous decision. Vic, I have problems with this. I can't ask for Adamic to knock out Gwynn because no one has ever knocked out Gwynn and he's faced everyone in the heavyweight division. But, I mean, he keeps doing this. He just keeps fighting these guys to get by and get a shot based on his popularity in the Polish, you know, community. And the fact that he's a draw, I, I'm not happy with this. Like, we got Seth Mitchell taking on guys like Jonathan Banks and Chris Ariola, while this guy is just like, he's on the outskirts fighting the, the fringe contenders and the old school veterans that are fading until he gets his shot. Like, they were really saying that he was like a top five heavyweight on that telecast. Is that even, is that even fucking true? Oh, not now. I mean, certainly not now. No, I mean Adamic. Adamic. He, at this point in his career, he's on the top five heavyweight. Back then, when he beat Ariola, maybe that jumped him up the rankings, and that's how he got that title shot. But not now. Certainly not now. Yeah, I don't. I don't understand, dude. I mean, this guy, like, I don't know. I mean, you have anything on this fight? Um, you know, I'm just basically giving the results for the listeners that use us for news. But I, I really like was. I don't know. I think I was texting or tweeting during this fight. Like, I barely watched it. He looked good, though. I will say that. He looked like the Adamic of old. He didn't look like the Adamic that fought Nagy Aguilera or the Adamic that fought Eddie Chambers or the Adamic that fought Steve Cunningham. He barely got hit. I don't know. I mean, it just could be that Dominic Gwynn is that fucking old and tired. But well, I mean, uh, all, all that leaves... Uh... You know, for him winning, it might get Brian Jennings on HBO. So, well, I'm I'm happy with that. I'm very happy with that. And I don't know. Um, I mean, no, I if he loses, if he loses, there's no shot in hell that Brian Jennings is gonna get on HBO. Well, I think this is uh, I think this is uh, Sweet Boxing at Sweet Boxing on Twitter, Mr. Ryan Bivens. This is you. I guess not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it is right. you. Oh, okay. So, what's up, brother? What's going on? Yeah, you know, I'm just listening. I'm waiting for Heather Hockey to come on, actually. Uh, yeah, but, she'll be on yeah. in 11 minutes. But now that we got you on, what do you know about Minchu? I know this is your division. You're big on the cruiserweight division. What do you know about him? Did he look good last night? Does that mean that this is how he always looks, or was this, a, you know, something lucky? I wouldn't call it lucky, but he, he studied his opponent, and that was a luxury that Eddie didn't have. There's really not much footage of him showing out there, um, and he he knew how to fight him. He he spoiled the spoiler, you know. Eddie is used to you know being the guy to uh, you know take a, take advantage of guys that are being aggressive and making mistakes, and this guy was not aggressive at all. 
You know, he, he was the one always, you know, moving away and uh, making Eddie do something that he usually isn't accustomed to doing. I mean, it, in a way, it kind of reminded me of uh, how John Pascal made uh, Chad Dawson have to chase him around the, the ring. And, you know, Chad can't fight like that. That's just not part of his DNA. But the million-dollar question is this, Mr. Bivens. Is he going to look this good versus other cruiserweights? What you know? Yeah. Oh. Um, no. No, oh, because really? um, lo, 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 as he fights the same kind of fight like that, which he's not, because and normally he, he, he would be, you know, more of a banger. But if he fought that fight against a guy like Marco Huck, I mean, Huck is used to, you know, walking guys down. I mean, that's what he does. You know, that, so that, that, that wouldn't work. And Huck would just, you know, he would, you know, get hit. But Huck would, you know, just, you know, get to him and would work. And he was, like, you know, looking to, you know, land a clean shot and, like, you know, get back out. You know, he wasn't trying to get hit himself. Um, other guys that are, you know, used to being aggressive, you know, they'll take punches, you know, to land, you know, better punches. And Eddie wasn't, you know, just not, that's not how he fights. What about Huck's opponent, uh, the one he's had the, the three fights with, uh, Obalafi? Um, how would you do against him? Oh, I don't even want to think about that. I mean, that, that, that would be a horrible fight to look at, I think. All right, well, I was trying to give the Cruiserweight division a chance. You know, I always tell you the same thing. I mean, no, that's yeah. like... <laughs> no, no, no. That's a division I mean, of... Uh, it's like a cemetery, that division. Apart, apart from this Chambers fight, had been really good this year. I mean, you, you look at... Uh, let me think back. There was a Vladarchik fight um, with uh, Rakeem Skyev. Um, I suppose before that... Um, yeah, the Dennis Lebedev fight with uh, Jeremy Jones. You know, they, these are really, they, you know, the fights that are, you know, at the world championship level are, you know, really good. You know, this this one the championship fight. These these guys are, you know, working their way up. All right. Well, thanks for the. Uh... Well, Ryan, Ryan, look, can I get some insight? I know you're from Philly, and uh, I know you know Eddie Chambers. Uh, what do you think of him? I mean, is this the right move for him to stay a cruiser? Well, if if he's going to stay at Cruiser, he has to throw more punches. I mean that that I mean he should have known that going in. I mean you you got to be busy, you know, against guys that you know are going to throw. A uh, heavyweight, you know, they you know they just don't throw that many punches because you know they'll get tired. But Cruiser are going to be busy, and so Eddie's got to be busy too. And you know it just it, it's after being the defensive fighter for so long, you know it's it's kind of hard to to change up. Um, that, that was a concern I had, you know, even before the, the fight happened. And I even talked to, uh, you know, one of the trainers at his gym, Shores, you know, not anybody that worked this corner, but, you know, he, he had the same concerns. You know, if you're a defensive fighter, you know, how do, how do you all of a sudden become an offensive fighter after, after all those years? Well... Oh, you got something else, Vic? No, no, I just, just um, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the, have you seen have you seen any Eddie Eddie Chambers interviews where it might have been a weight thing, or is it, it just had a he just had an off night? Oh, it's definitely not weight. I mean, he was he was as low as like 190 in training camp, and you know he felt strong. You know, his opponent said he was strong, stronger than he expected. It was just you know. Uh, didn't have his timing, you know, he's been off like a year. And, uh, I mean, he's, he's on Twitter, he's talking about some business problems, but I don't know anything about that. But I remember when I was at his, his open workout, he, he even had tiny problems, you know, working the mitts, uh, hitting his speed bag. Um, and, like, you could see the frustration on his face um, of just not you know, getting shots off, you know, and... and in a manner that it was was good enough, you know, like he he visibly you know showed that he wasn't happy with his own performance, and that was just you know warming up. That's just interesting. I, I don't know. This I thought I'd see a better Eddie Chambers yesterday. I was just a little disappointed. 
Well, hopefully he gets another crack at it. I mean, main events, uh, they don't turn their back on their fighters, and uh, I'm sure we'll see him again. But hey, they need, they need to match him better. Give him somebody that's going to come to him, you know. Give, give him a guy to hit. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's, he, he, he is a spoiler. That, that's straight up his style. You know, if you're going to have somebody come in and, and you know, and be counteractive to, to what makes him a good fighter, then... He's not going to be that good because he, he, I don't think he's like a, a, he doesn't have like a full, you know, range of skills that he can do. Like, you know, he's good at these things and if he can't do those things in, in a particular fight, then he just can't be very good in that fight. He's just too set in his ways at this point. Well, Thanks, Mr. Bivens, for calling in. Definitely uh, keep up the good work. Uh, clearly, my tweet went unnoticed, but, uh, you know, you are appreciated in my eyes, and I'm pretty sure by many of other boxing fans that de don't even know who you are because, uh, you know, whenever I can't catch a fight, I know where to get it in uh, Sweet Boxing Videos. Unfortunately, you have numerous different websites, so it's kind of hard to give you, you know, give out your link now on the show, but... You know, just follow him at Sweet Boxing, uh, and he has every fight, like literally every fight. And it's usually like within minutes of the fight airing. So uh, thanks for calling in and continue to do good work for, you know, us and all other boxing fans that can't get those, you know, overseas fights or even some of the fights that happen here. Sometimes I forget to use my DVR and I still go to your site. But Vic, um, another five months. What? <laughs> what happened in five months? I'm retiring. What? Yeah. Why? I mean, why? I'm trying to do other things. You're not going to be doing videos no more? Uh, No, not giving them away for free, you know, on demand uh, immediately after they happen. I don't have time for that anymore. Wow. Why, why'd you come on here and, and give the fucking boxing fans uh, bad news, dude? <laughs> That's not cool. For real. I literally use your site all the time. Yeah, but um, we're going to we're gonna have to do something, man. We're going to have to do something. We, we could talk off air. We're going to have to get you uh, some sort of support, man, because I'm pretty sure there's more people like me. But uh, I got three minutes till Heather Hardy, so we'll pick it up off air. We can't let you retire. That's for sure. You, you're too. You, you know, you're very important to uh, us boxing fans, especially me. I use you for research and stuff. You can't just, you can't just hang up the gloves. You're too young. No, I'm definitely not too young. I'm too old. <laughs> Way too old. I don't know. Well, if you too old, I know me and Vic have met you plenty. I've seen you plenty of times, but uh, we're we're, we're taking it downhill here, but we'll definitely talk off air and, and see what we, could, what we could do, man, because, uh, again, you're very important to boxing. Yeah. All right, Ryan. All right, have so, a good one. You too. So, Vic, uh, Mike Alvarado uh, will defend his belt against uh, Russia's Ruslan Ravanenko on October 19th, HBO at the First Bank Center in uh, Broomfield. Colorado, right outside Alvarado's hometown of Denver. Um, after he came to terms with his promoter to top rank on Thursday, finally, because the last time we thought it was official, it wasn't official, clearly. But, Vic, since you haven't said anything, although the deal isn't signed yet, but uh, HBO is in process of finalizing the deal to acquire... Um, American broadcast rights for the heavyweight championship, Vladimir Klitschko, to defend his title against Alexander Povetkin. What do you think about that? Well, obviously, HBO at times wasn't in the business of heavyweight boxing. Uh, and right now, uh, it seems the stance is that they're buying the fight, not the fighter. I don't know how long that's going to last because they turned down Andre Ward a few times. Um, and this is, you know, it's a big heavyweight fight. It's probably the biggest one you can make at this time. Uh, aside from Klitschko versus Klitschko, you got the last remaining regular belt. I'm sure once Klitschko, if he beats Povetkin, they'll make another regular belt for someone else. But it is the fight that, you know, Povetkin 
Klitschko was supposed to happen a few times, didn't happen, and now it's happening. You pair that with Miguel Cotto and uh, Devin Rodriguez, it should be a big night of boxing. Absolutely. They're what they're gonna do is um, they're gonna televise it, the fight that is live in the afternoon, probably like five o'clock, and then they're gonna replay it prime time along with the live coverage of the Miguel Cotto Devin Rodriguez fight. But uh, 347 usually means New York, so I believe we have Heather, the Heat Hardy. Is this you? This is me. (laughs) This is you. So How are you? We are good. We're happy to have you. Uh, I'm joined alongside my co-host, Victor Salazar. Vic, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the Heat. Um, Heather, for those that don't know you... I guess you're going to have to give some backstory. Now, I did a lot of research, and I watched about every documentary you have all over YouTube. I actually Mm -hmm. noticed, Vic, (laughs) let me tell you a funny story I didn't have time to tell you off air, was that she fought the girl that you interviewed on the Saddam Ali card. Yeah, Michaela, right? Michaela? Yeah. Yeah, I fought her two times. Fought her twice. Yeah, I wanna. I actually want to get into that, Michaela. Uh, when you fought Michaela, uh, I believe in the first round you suffered a knockdown, but you got mm-hmm. up and you definitely made that a ten-nine round. I mean, yeah. What, what about? It was it, it was my pro debut, so I was getting used to the distance, the smaller gloves, like everything was, you know, was super new to me, and then, and then. She landed a really clean right hand that knocked me right on my behind, and I got up, and I heard the rest count, and I was like, all right, have a no more boxing. Just, you got to fight, girl. You got to fight. You got to beat this girl up to win this fight. So, you know, I, all that thinking I was doing just went out the door, and just me came out. It definitely did because um, I scored that round uh, a 10-9. I believe that you did enough in that round to come back and at least deserve a 10-9 instead of a 10-8. But uh, Mm -hmm. what I wanted to ask you about that fight was that you, in the amateurs, I noticed that you were fighting at 125, which is clearly featherweight division, but Mm -hmm. for their pro debut, I believe it was like 115? It was a 118. It was a 118 fight. And for the amateurs, I was walking around about 124, like all the time, because I was fighting in tournaments and I was so active. And so he said I do my pro debut at 118, figuring I would go down in weight. That, you know, most of the girls, if I fought at 126, were going to be bigger than me coming down to 126. And I was a natural 124. So we said, you know, you train a little extra, get down to 118. But I guess at my age, a post-mom body, <laughs> you know, it just didn't want to go down. I couldn't get past 119. And, I mean, I did everything but cut off a leg to get down there. Well, it's not for me that light. I, I wanted to keep this interview as professional as possible, but you mm-hmm. mentioned post-mom body. I have to let mm-hmm. my listeners know that you do not have a post-mom body. Like, <laughs> I, You know what's uh, funny not, is... Not really. <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny is that um, I always see you in Gleason's because they usually do, you know, Golden Boy usually does a lot of media days there and I've always seen right. you training and I never knew that was you. Really? Never I'm knew. I just always, I swear <laughs> to God, I just always seen you training you got huge calf muscles is what sticks yeah. out to me. <laughs> so I've always seen you training. Then, you know, I, you, we get the call and we're like, we're going to do this interview. So I'm like, oh, let me do some research. I'm like, oh, wait, that's the girl from Gleason's. And um, I, I know your trainer. I think it's Cormac, right? Devon, yeah. All right. So now tell our listeners how you got your start because it's kind of an interesting story. I mean, you just went from, I guess, being bored to fighting. Yeah, I mean, I started um, like at a, doing like the cardio kickboxing. You know, you put the radio on, and everybody jump around and hit the bag, and it was fun. And just for play, like they opened up this little school by my house. So I'll put the baby to bed and run up and, and go, you know, just play around. And then I knew that it was something that I wanted so bad. Like I needed to have it in my life. And where else are you going to go? I live in Brooklyn, so I, I walked into Gleason's and the first day I met Bruce, I, he said, what can I do for your kid? And I said, I want to I wanna be the best. I want to be a world champion. I don't want to play around. Um, getting old and, you know, so I need somebody who's going to be serious. And he introduced me to Devon's sister, Ashley. 
Alicia Ashley, who was a four-time world champion boxer. She also used to be a kickboxer. And she was training me and um, had a few other, another girl who was a Golden Glove champion in the amateurs and did a lot of traveling to the tournaments with her. So when she was gone, Devon would work my corner and work with me. And then um, I had my second fight under Alicia. It was my second boxing match. And again, Devon was working my corner as she was out of town. And I lost my fight. I was 0-2. I started the amateurs 0-2. And after the fight, we were we were in the office, and I looked at him, and I was crying, and I said, Devon, I don't want to lose anymore. And he was like, all right. And he took me over. <laughs> I became his project. <laughs> I've watched a, a few of the sparring matches that you've had with uh, with Alicia. She's actually very tall and long. How is mm-hmm. that for you? I mean, uh, clearly it's good work because you get to see an awkward – style, something that you probably won't see in many women. I mean, there's not that many women that tall and long, as, as long as she is anyway, for that matter. Yeah, she's a southpaw, and she her movement is, I mean, like nobody moves like slick. So, I mean, if I land one punch in six rounds, I feel good at the end of the day. So when I squat with her, I mean, I get in with somebody else, and I'm like, Devin, why don't they move their head, you know, <laughs> because she's so good. So I feel like, you know, the, with the girls that I do spar with, you know, it's, it's, I put in my work at the gym, so my fights will be easy because my sparring is... I well, mean, for those that don't know, you're mm-hmm. not giving yourself enough credit because if you... Well, I've seen you land on her, but not only is she a former champion, she's also a kickboxing champion and also a yeah. dancer, which helps her move as you know, seamlessly as she does in the ring because she was a dancer for quite a few years, right? I know. I mean, everything Ashley does, she does it great. So um, I, I do all right with her. I mean, I hold my own. I'm okay. But, I mean, there's no mistake in who's the world champion when her and I are in the ring at Greasons. <laughs> but she's the current super bantamweight um, world champion right now. So she she's the best that there is in my weight division. So who, who else could I possibly want to look up to than the girl who's sitting all the way up at the top. I know where I have to go or what it's going to take for me to be the best, and it's going to be to be able to stand in there with her and give her a fight fight. So that's what keeps me humble, makes me know I got a really long way to go before I get up there because I'm training among the best, you know. Nobody else in my fights anywhere near on my level is going to show me what these girls show me in the ring when I'm sparring. I'm not going to be surprised by somebody with five or six or seven fights when I'm sparring with these girls who have been in the game for longer than I even knew how to lace up my gloves. Now, I want to ask you, um, I know you've used the words, I I guess, once you got in the ring, you knew this is what you wanted to do. But I guess Mm -hmm. my question to you is, why? This doesn't pay very much for women's boxing. There isn't that much competition. I mean, the girl that you fought twice has Mm -hmm. no wins, and she's still ranked 11 in the world. So it isn't it? Doesn't it get frustrating for you? Um, it doesn't because regardless of of who is in front of me when I fight or how much money I make, it is still um. There's still so much left for me to learn. Like like I said, I spar with Ashley. I spar with the Solano girls. So I know that I'm nowhere near as good as I can be. So it's, it's the drive to just keep getting better, to figure it out, to learn how to make my punches straighter. You, you know what I'm saying? It's like... It's like I got uh, you. I don't, I don't know how to say it in words, but... To me, what motivates me every single day to keep on going is knowing that I can make a little something better today, make it a little better tomorrow, make it a little better Wednesday. And then I wait again, when I get back in the ring and it all comes comes out, it's, it's so nice. I hear you. I hear you. But uh, I do want to let our listeners know that you have a bit of Christy Martin in you because you're probably mm-hmm. going to be the next female to headline a card now that you have a deal with Lou DeBella. Am I right? It looks that way. It certainly looks that way. 
when I met when I met Michael, he he said that that I fight like Christy Martin, or like a like a female. That's why Louis tells me I fight. I'm like a female John Buddy. <laughs> I want to ask, what is like? Tell us because you know me doing the research to be able to at least interview you. I don't think it's enough. Uh, not only to for that to transcend to our listeners and for them to get to know you, but for myself, either I think, wh- why are why is there so much hype behind you? I mean, at the end of the day, you started five years ago. You're probably in your not 30s. even. I'm in the game three. It's just three years. And, and you're I had my what? first fight in 2010. You're 29 now. No, I'm 31. Exactly. So why is there so much hype behind the heat? I don't. I don't get it. What did you do? <laughs> I'm not sure. I think because, you know, I'm in Gleason's, which is a really, really popular gym, and I was working for Bruce. I did volunteer work for USA Boxing, so everybody in the game knows who I am just from that. And people respect me because they come in the gym, and I'm there, and I work so hard. Like, I'm not one of those girls who are just come in the gym and is natural at this boxing and just pick it up. Like, I'm uncoordinated, and... I'm like, you know, geeky. I'm the girl that walks up the stairs and trips three times, you know? Like, I'm I'm, I'm not naturally good at this. I'm, I've been successful because I work so, so hard. Like, Blimp always tell me, hardest working girl in showbiz. <laughs> I really am. I work so hard. So I think that people are just respect my work ethic, and everybody likes to see a story like that. Like, the girl, nobody expects to win, but she keep on winning. You know, when everything else is going wrong, she keep on working, she keep on winning. Absolutely. Um, tell us about the movie. I mean, I hear they're making a movie on you. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, the producer, Natasha Verma, she, she came to me like a year ago. We had met when she was doing like a school project, and I think like her teacher or something sent her class to Gleason's, and they had to pick like people to just you know, do, like, small portrait plan. Mm-hmm. So I volunteered, like, a few hours, and she put together this cute little thing. And then, like, six or eight months later, she she came to me with this idea of doing a story about the um, struggles and the inequality for women in the sport and how different it is for, for the females. And she asked, she said, would you be interested? And let me um, kind of feature you in, in the piece, you know, like a single working mom from Brooklyn and everything you've been through, if we could just kind of title them together. So I was so honored and so excited. So seeing this whole story come together has given me like a new focus, a new purpose. I'm so excited for it to come out. So now you're, you're, you're Irish descent, and you definitely wear your colors into the ring, so we're assuming yeah. you're going to be somewhere in the Madison Square Garden Theater, Roseland Ballroom, mm-hmm. Broadway Boxing. Um, mm-hmm. What's next for the Heat? I'm not sure. I mean, the only plans I have is to keep training, keep getting better every day, keep fighting, and keep winning. So, I mean, um, I have another another fight with Lou, so I'm hoping to be back in the ring sometime soon. But, I mean, my my long-term goal is to be the best, so I've got to take every little step I can to get there. Absolutely. Uh, now, there's other documentaries. I actually watched one um, where you like take a bus and a train mm-hmm. to the gym. Like, how far yeah. do you live from this gym? If you drive, it's not so far, but I don't drive, so I take a bus and two trains to the gym in the morning. It's like a little over, like maybe an hour and fifteen minutes or so. A little over an hour. I wouldn't be asking a male boxer, but being a woman at 4:49 in the morning, you're not mm-hmm. afraid, you know, standing at the bus stop, going through the train at this. I mean, that documentary was fairly done well. I mean, I I got to know a lot. I seen your daughter, and I seen how hard yeah. you work. It was, it was really good. I seen you fall asleep a bunch of times, so you definitely. <laughs> I do. I'm the worst. You definitely. <laughs> it was uh, a funny working. thing. Like all New Yorkers will tell you, you fall asleep on the train. You wake up that minute before the train doors open at your stop every time. <laughs> but no, no, I mean, I really, I, I don't, I don't get nervous. I think because I grew up doing it. I went to, to high school 
in Queens, so it was, you know, three buses just to get to my high school. So public transportation, I went to John Jay College, so it was a bus and two trains just to get to college when I was 17 years old. So, you know, I worked downtown Manhattan for a while, so I pretty much have been growing up on public transportation. So taking the bus at 5 a.m. is ain't no thing for me. That's what so, it is around here. <laughs> Let me ask you two part question here. Because so many media days are held in Gleason's, and I've seen you so many times. Again, I just never knew mm -hmm. you were you. But I've always noticed that you don't get starstruck. You continue to work. Like, yeah. because Adrian Broner is there, you don't stop jumping rope to come get an autograph or take right. a picture. Like, Malinaji being there, Danny Garcia, I mean, Bernard Hopkins was there, and you mm -hmm. were there. All the big names have been in Gleason's uh, this year alone. And, yeah. you know, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't stop your routine, but also is that added motivation that one day that news and media crew will be there for you? Of course. I mean, you, you training at Gleason's, I do get to see some of the, the best come in and out of the gym. And whenever I see... Like the big hype for the big fights, I always feel like that's going to be me one day. And that's not just some kids thinking crazy. I really believe that. That is going to be me one day. So the reason why I don't get so starstruck is because usually I'm at the gym. I'm not there hanging out or I'm not there looking for anybody. Most of the time, I don't even know when people are coming to the gym. I'm at the gym either because I have to train or because I got to work. <laughs> Like, I watched a movie one time, and they said, you love the Yankees so much, the Yankees ain't going to pay your bills. And it's true. <laughs> you know, there I got, is, I got kids to question. feed, so if I'm at the gym, I got to focus. There is one question that I've been dying to ask, because your documentary wasn't able to let me know, but you kind of hinted in your documentary, like, the married life. Well, not really married mm -hmm. life, but you mentioned that the wife role isn't for you. So you didn't get into or they didn't uh, allow us to see how you guys got to that point in the conversation. But I wanted to ask, because what I got out of it clearly is this, that you were in a relationship and you decided to box in, instead of be in that relationship and you parted ways. What happened or how did you get to that part of the conversation? Because that's what I didn't understand. So my mom That's a just really good wild. question. Nobody ever asked me that before. <laughs> um, no, that's because you're on the no, boxing I, voice, you know. We, we ask the best um, questions. I, what's that? <laughs> no, I said that's because you're on the boxing voice. We ask the best questions. <laughs> that was a good question, yeah. <laughs> no, I was married and I got divorced. But I got divorced before the boxing. Um, you know, like, I was married to a guy who was not a bad guy. He was a nice guy. He just, I was not the type of woman that he wanted to marry and he was not the type of man for me. I'm not, you know, like some men are just looking for a woman to stay at home and, and be a stay at home uh, mom and do that kind of stuff and I guess go to Target on the weekends and <laughs> bake apple pie but that stuff just wasn't for me and I felt like, I always said I felt like when I was like in that life like it would be like a guy walking around in a dress you know, like, just not right. Something's just not right. So we uh, split up and were separated for, like, four years before the divorce actually went through. But, um, you know, I was split up from him, struggling to keep my kid in school, to pay my bills. And I knew that the one thing missing in my life was fighting. <laughs> so I ran to the gym. And so boxing was just one piece that my we would fight about, but there were a million other pieces. But that just goes to So it's not that I wouldn't want to be somebody's wife. It would be <laughs> nice to be somebody's wife, but you got to be a wife for the right person. And when I was married, I just was not, I was, he was not the right person. Well, clearly whoever marries you has to bake the pies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> so, all right, let me ask you. Um, I know you wear the Irish colors, but I need to be sure. I just got a few uh, messages in the chat here for some of the Irish people. They want to mm -hmm. make sure that you are Irish. Mm hmm Okay. Well, there you go, uh, sir. Of course I'm Irish. My, my great-grandma was born in Dublin, and she moved from Dublin to Scotland before coming to America. So when she came to America... Everyone would say she was Scottish because she came from there, but she was brought up, born and raised in Ireland. So she felt like she was an Irish girl. But my family came from, they went from Dublin to Clive Bank in Scotland, right to Garrison Beach, Brooklyn, where I am right now. He says that uh, it's because the Irish are stubborn, right? Mm -hmm. Some of us are. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly you might be, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so this is good. This Stubborn is good. than that. Once I set my head to something, there's no taking me off the track. If I make up my mind to do something, I'm going to do it. Nothing, nobody's going to stop me. But that's what's most interesting about you is that you you didn't know boxing. Like, you were just a mom that wanted to lose weight is the impression that mm -hmm. I got. You just wanted that's to get exactly the baby what it was. Home. I just went in the gym to do some take some classes, and I just wanted, like, a piece of heather back. Like I said, I was stuck in this marriage that I felt like I didn't fit, so I wanted to do something for me. I had just graduated from college. Like, at, at one point, I was in college, so I had that. And then after I had graduated, it was like I had nothing. So I went and done these, like, little cardio classes and had a few exhibition kickboxing matches around, and I loved it. And then once the divorce was going through, I couldn't afford to go back to the school. I had to give it up for like a year. And even though it was just an hour a day in the gym with the radio on, I mean, I just, I missed, I missed it so much. And that's what drove me to go into Gleason's because so that, you know, I could work 18 hours a day, but I need this little piece of my life back. Like I missed it that much. Well, I want to say again that you don't give yourself enough credit. I, I've heard you say mm -hmm. today and on some of those documentaries that I watched that you're uncoordinated and you're a little <laughs> goofy and things like that, and that you're not a natural. But to have such a late start, to be just a college mom, walk into the gym and then decide that you're going to be a professional fighter, get to the the accolades that you've gotten as an amateur, I mean, you won the Golden Gloves. You were a silver uh, medalist, right? Silver and gold. There you go. I mean, and, mm -hmm. and you've won nationals, and now you're an undefeated pro. They're making a movie about you. You're going to probably be the second woman to headline a boxing event. I think you need to start not saying that and lifting your head up high. <laughs> you're doing a very good job. I mean... I think I need to talk to you every night because you make me smile and blush <laughs> over <Aww>. here. <laughs> I didn't know really I had that sweet. effect Thank on you. people. But uh, no, it's just the <laughs> truth. I mean, you know, when I had to do the mm -hmm. research, I'm looking and I'm, and then it was just, it was a, it was a better feeling for me because you were always there. So it was kind of like, all right, let me find out the most I can about this person because I'm always in Gleason's covering other fighter and fighters, and I completely overlooked someone that clearly is destined for greatness. Thank you so much. But that is all I have. Um, there's definitely a lot of people there listening and speaking in the chat and on Twitter, so give them all your... Ness, Ness I, got, I got a question before you end this. Um, okay. This hey, Heather... Cool. Salazar, Heather. Yeah, sorry, yeah. You know, Ness was going on, and I didn't want to stop him. Um, being that, you know, this is a tough sport, and a lot of females don't get the accolades they deserve and don't make the money they deserve, uh, what's your ultimate goal in the sport? And is it to a point where you, you're going to have to go to, like, Mexico, like, you know, Kalisha West did, and uh, I forget the other one. Uh, what's her name, Ness, from San Francisco? Ava Knight, Ava Knight went, you know. I mean, what, what, what are you trying to get out of this? Um, I definitely would like to get a world title. I mean, and I want, like, like I said, I, I share an office every day with Alicia Ashley, and I look at her WBC belt every day hanging on the wall. So um, my goal is as far as fighting and boxing, 
I was really, that's where I'm headed. And that's where I've been headed since my very first amateur fight. So even when I win my fight, I'm in the gym the very next day. I mean, my coach are going over, even though I won, all the things that I did wrong that I have to fix before the next one. So even though I'm winning and things are happening, I'm on the path to go up and, you know, there, there's not going to be any stop in that. Can I get there? But aside from that, I've had the opportunity while doing this movie to really take a look at the history of females in the sport and how hard it was for the girls before me. And with the way we have social media now and Facebook and Twitter and, and all that kind of thing to be able to get out there and tell people, hey, look at what's going on. Look how when I'm making the same kind of money, how, how much harder it is for us to get on the cards. We can make people aware of it, you know. I fight. And still, even at my last fight, people come up to me outside Roseland and in the crowd and they're like, oh my God, you could really fight. And these are boxing fans who are surprised that the girls could fight. I mean, I feel like that's become part of what my job is too, to show people that I could look like a girl and fight like a boy. <laughs> you could. It doesn't matter that we're females, we train the same way, we fight just as hard. And we're just as entertaining. So until we can be looked at the very same way, I think that there's still work to be done in the sport. Well, I have something else for you. Uh, being as though that you are trying to take female boxing in a different direction and, and, and open up awareness, I guess, for those that don't know how tough it is for the women before you and to come after you. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts, Vic? Uh, help me out here. What's the really sexy uh, female boxer? Uh, she just fought, right? What's her name? We just we did an interview on her the other day. Oh, the Mexican one, or yeah, the one that she did, uh, Playboy. La Barbie, the the Mexican one. I, I don't know, uh, Mariana Juarez. All right, the 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 the, the, the name is not truly important. Uh, what it is, mm -hmm. what is important is what is your thoughts on. The fact that she had to turn to play clearly because I'm assuming financial, you know, is the only thing that could come to my mind simply because boxing doesn't pay enough for her. Do is that some not asking you is that something you would do, but is that something that you look down upon because it's no not, way you can't look down upon that. I mean, she I don't know who she is, but she is a grown woman who has decisions to make, and if that was her choice, then who am I to look down on her? It, it could no, have been no, done but, well, let me for it. a million reasons, but it's not my place to judge. The same way it's not my place to judge if people want to say, who is that girl to go out and make a movie? Or who is that girl to go out and do interviews on TV? You know what I mean? We all make choices, and we do what we think is going to be best for us, and best for sport. And, I mean... Well... Well, Heather, let me rephrase it because clearly it came off wrong. What I mean is because women are looked as sex objects and then mm -hmm. you're in a sport that is dominated by males, it's kind of – do you feel that it, it would be tougher for women to be taken seriously – if there are other female boxers doing that, is what I meant. I don't fight. think so. I don't think so, because I look really good in a bikini, but I can fight, too. And I'm not embarrassed to wear a bikini. <laughs> you can have a nice ass and shake it and still kick it, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Vic, so what weight is the Barbie? She's Ava Knight's weight. I, I'd have to look it up. Because oh. uh, Ava Knight beat her in Mexico. Check it out. Check it out. See if we're ever going to see a possible Hardy versus Knight or uh, <laughs> Wes or or even the Barbie. Because actually, uh, um, Miss Hardy, uh, the Barbie is basically the famous female boxer right now, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. Right, Vic? It's her and that girl from Costa Rica. Which is well, a she's nice a super flyweight right now. Oh, yeah. You guys will never meet. Well, I just, I just have I just have one more question for her before <laughs> before I uh, you know I don't know if she has to go, but my, my my last question is what I wanted to know was uh, obviously Ronda Rousey is is that woman in MMA right now? She just headlined a pay per view. Um, Holly Holm, you know, retired boxer, just went into the MMA field. 
basically because maybe there's more money into it. Is that something down the line that maybe we'll see Heather Hardy doing, transitioning to mixed martial arts because done, there's more money I've in that I've done kickboxing before, and I really... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We didn't hear you. What you said? No, I'm, I interrupted him, so I said, I'm sorry. Finish asking. No, I was just asking if that's something down the road that might become of Heather Hardy because of you know the financials that come within women's boxing. And obviously, Ronda Rousey took it that far. Holly Holm transitioned over there, so I'm just asking if that's a you know a possible route for you. It wouldn't be a route to go that I would choose to go on because of um, anything financial. I really fight because I love it, and I do love to kick. <laughs> I love to kick people, but um, I'm not really crazy about um, jujitsu and all that stuff on the floor. So I would say maybe because I don't like to count anything out, but. Probably not because I really don't like jujitsu at all. Like, like I just like, get off me. <laughs> I'd rather stand up and fight than roll around. So. Exactly. That's the same feeling. Ninety-nine percent of the boxing fans that happen to stumble across UFC say, like, nobody want to see two guys all over each other. Yeah, just is funny, and the training is funny. And if you ever went into one of those gyms where, like, I've seen the the training before, and and it just was like, gross. Get off me. <laughs> yeah. Well, Miss Hardy, thank you for giving us the opportunity to interview you and get to know you just a little bit better. Uh, we thank you for having you... me. It was awesome. No, it, pleasure was all ours. You were a great guest. And, uh, you know, we wish you the best, of course, in boxing and with this movie. We really hope that this movie is going to be that I guess that vessel that would transcend you and women's boxing, because I know that you said in one of your documentaries as well that even if you don't do it for you, you want to open the doors for the rest of the women. And maybe Doesn't this movie is funny. that vessel that gets that door open, has other boxing fans turn to women's boxing, because MMA is popular with the women. I mean, you know, there's a few... Uh, Good women in MMA and uh, a lot they get good ratings, so it just has to transcend into female boxing. Yeah, it's, it will happen. This movie is is the girl who did put this movie Natasha together did an amazing job. Really, you're gonna love it. Well, give everyone your social media, Facebook, yes. uh, Twitter, and definitely wherever that because I know that there's a Facebook link to the trailer of the movie, right? Yeah, we have it on the Facebook page. You can look me up, Heather Hardy. And on uh, my Twitter is at Heather Hardy Box. It's well, at thank Heather you. Hardy Box. And thank we have you all again, that and uh, we hope to have you stuff. on soon, and you have a good night. Thank you, you too. And next time you're at Gleason's, come say hi, okay? I will. I most definitely <laughs> will now. Don't worry. All right, good. All, all right, right, guys. Bye-bye. Vic, I... I uh. I like her, man. I, I've watched a lot of her fights <laughs> since it wasn't that many to see. Um, you know, she's only got five fights, I believe. But uh, her story is interesting, man. It makes me feel like I could put down the microphone and walk into the gym and beat up a few people, too. But I won't work as hard as she worked. Believe that. I hate <laughs> running. That yeah, you, well, I was quiet. The chat was uh, exploding, man. <laughs> she was funny, so. <laughs> they were what? Yeah, they get getting on you, man. They say you were flirting, trying to kick game. What? <laughs> oh my God! Don't ruin a good interview, guys. <laughs> That's the problem right there with women's boxing. I mean, we we have to start taking this thing serious, man. That's a bug, and I never I never once crossed the line. Get out of here. Anyway, uh, <laughs> what do we got? Oh my God, Vic, your cousin. He's going to box again. Michael Caxidi is talking about a possible farewell fight in Toowoomba, Australia. Well, I mean, Mike, he's taking a lot of punishment, man. I, I don't know, man. Uh, Mencha whooped his ass. Th has he ever come back after that Mencha fight? No, nah, I think that was his last fight. I'm not sure. I got to look that up. Mencha's I mean... never been back. Mencha looked really good in that fight. We never seen him again. That was another African, by the way, right? Or Nigerian. I don't know. Vic, you gotta ask Molly Bongway. Vic, your boy, the one we just had on a couple of weeks ago, Jonathan Bomba Gonzalez, not 
the fat La Bomba, but the other Bomba uh, is training with Alvin, Ivan, Ivan, Ivan Calderon, uh, one of Puerto Rico's best fighters to come out of Puerto Rico in preparation for the August 17th fight with Giovanni Segura. What's your thoughts, my man? Could uh, could Calderon teach the young Gonzalez anything to well, have I mean, to be well, exceptional? I don't know, dude. I mean, Segura beat him twice. Uh, obviously, obviously, Calderon's probably a uh, first ballot Hall of Famer. Um, and his legs were gone, they say, when he fought Segura. I mean, a lot of people are saying this is a big step up and too early for uh, Gonzalez, which I kind of agree with, but, I mean... He wants a world title shot when I talk to him, and he thinks this is going to get him a world title shot. 112 is a stacked division. It's it's just hard. I mean, the, the, the top ten guys are, are, are class. They're elite. So sink or swim, I guess. I guess, man. So um, Amir Khan, Devin Alexander, we touched on it a little bit. They're both playing the blame game. He's holding up the fight. No, he's holding up the fight. What's the truth, Vic? I have no idea. Let's see. No clue. Hmm. None. Uh, I mean, what wasn't the, the issue that they didn't want to, to fight in Dubai or something like that? And now, I don't know, man. I mean, is that really a, a fight you're really interested in, Master? All right. Whatever. No is doubt. it? I'm asking you. I'm asking you. I mean, um, uh, I I would love to see that fight. Actually, that really? fight for me is just as good as I guess. Peterson, Lucas was, and it's probably just as good as uh, Danny Lucas. I mean, why not? What's wrong with Devin Alexander versus Amir Khan? I don't know. Uh, I mean, do you want to keep seeing Ale I mean, Amir Khan fight guys like fucking Julio Diaz? I mean, Alexander's been through the gauntlet. Say what you want about Alexander and that he's, he's boring, but ever since the Urango fight, uh, who was next? Bradley, right? I mean, yeah, he's fought the guys. He has. He yeah, has. But... After Bradley, he fought uh, Katelnik. Uh, he fought Lucas. He fought Madonna. He fought uh, Randall Bailey. I mean, he's been in there. He's been in there. He's got Junior Witter under his belt. I mean, he's been in there. So, if anything, this is um, a great fight. These are two guys that have been in there with some good opposition. We got one guy that talks a good game. Then we got another guy that, that, that well, they both calling out Mayweather, so let the winner get Mayweather, right? Is that, is that what you're thinking, the winner gets Mayweather? I mean, that's not what I'm thinking because, you know, everybody was definitely not happy with the fact that Mayweather said he was uh, going to go and, you know, fight Devin Alexander, but it is what it is. You know what I mean? If, if, if Amir Khan's always wanting to fight uh, Mayweather, and if, if Devin Alexander could whitewash him, if he could do a Urango, this is the guy where we could possibly see that Urango again because of Amir Khan's chin. But also Amir Khan causes a lot of problems for Devin Alexander because he can match him in his speed, and he's he, he has a higher output than Alexander. But um, we definitely touched on uh, last week on Sergio Mora signing to the Bella. Um, you know, there, that's probably a possible Golovkin opponent, but it looks like Stevenson is going to be the guy because he's been on TV more. Um, so let's get up into the upcoming fights. I mean, we got some fights Friday, uh, August 9th. Um, and guys, uh, if you guys want to have Jose and Loco Hernandez on the show, let us know in the chat tonight so we could hook on, we could, we could schedule and we could also get Jose Pedraza. This is the Pedraza from Puerto Rico. So uh, definitely let us know yay or nay on that uh, before Thursday. But um, Jose Hernandez is going to be fighting in a 10-round lightweight uh, fight. I don't know how you pronounce this other dude's name, Vic, so help me out. Nugavev? Nugavev. 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 Vic. I have no idea. You're trying to... <laughs> okay. He's a Russian, right? <laughs> Uh, Pedraza is going to be fighting, uh, oh wait, Gabriel, check this guy out, is, I think we see him fight somebody, hmm, I'm going to have to look it up, so Pedraza is going to be in action on Friday night fights, but then on Showtime, we're going to have Dante Wilder versus Sergey Lyakovich, we're going to have Jamel Charlo versus Antoine Smith, um, Jamel Charlo, is this, 
Jamil and Jamal. Jam no, this is Jamal. This is the older. I mean, this is the the one without the dreads, right? Fighting Anton Smith. Is it the A or the E? The A. I don't know. Twin Charlo, baby. Yeah, he's gonna be fighting Antoine Smith. I believe uh, this is the older. I mean, not the older one, but the one without the dreads. That's a good fight uh, versus Antoine Smith. I want to check that out. Francisco Vargas, the guy we just had on, he's gonna be fighting an undefeated Brandon Bennett. The battle of the undefeateds in this fight. It's a good. Uh, this is a good quadruple header. Uh, I say quadruple because Gary Russell's on this card fight and Juan Ruiz in another, you know, feeler fight to check out his hands. This one is deserved. Other feeler fights that he has to check out his skills and et cetera, et cetera. But this one, he, he legitimately broke his hand in the last fight. So this is just a fight to make sure his hands are good. Saturday on Unimaz, Vic, uh, out in uh, Bethlehem, PA, we're going to have Gilmer Rodriguez versus Jorge Pazo. Uh, Felix Verderjo versus Alex Delgado. And Ronald Cruz back in action versus Rodolfo. Um, Ronald Cruz, man, I can't believe he's back in action. This dude just lost uh, you gotta again. Sell, you got to sell tickets over there. And you know who's going to sell tickets in Bethlehem. It's going to be Ronald Cruz. Probably the Boxing Voice television pick of the week is the non-television fight. Versus, it's going to be Anselmo Moreno versus William Ureña. Uh, 12 rounds for uh, Moreno's WBA Super Bantamweight title. Uh, this is going to happen on Saturday. So, Vic, maybe we should try and get um, uh, um, Salmo Moreno on Thursday. What do you think? Hey, I'm down. <laughs> Isn't he in, like, Nicaragua or Panama? Not, yeah, he's in Panama. He's in Panama. All right. All right. Well, that is everything for today's show. So, uh, you know, definitely voice your opinion. Call me now. Hit us up before we close these lines down. Call me now. You know what I mean? Vic, uh, what are you most excited for in this month of August? Uh, obviously, the HBO doubleheader. Um, Gail Barker and Kovalov Cleverly, even though we won't see Kovalov Cleverly live. So if you want to see that live, you're probably going to have to catch stream. Don't know why HBO Vic, is doing that. It makes we're absolutely both no going sense. going to that, right? Yeah, we're going to that. It's in that that Revel in AC. Both of us? I think so. Uh, you think there's any? All right, guys, listening. If there's any interest in a Gail Barker glove, let us know. Who else is on that card, Vic? There's a lot of people on that card, no? Uh, well, the Lorme's on that card. The Lorme. Mm, uh, the Lorme. The Lorme. The Lorme's fighting. Uh, sign the Lorme glove. The Lorme is fighting Gato Figueroa. Uh, That's going to be a pretty good scrap. It's a good way to test the Lorme. And Romero's fighting Kiko Martinez. Jonathan Romero? Yeah. Fighting the Kiko Martinez that lost to Frampton? Yeah, that guy. Oh, my God. And he's got a belt. Never been a lame -o. Never been a lame -o. Yes, you are. I think it's a good card. I mean, I know people are yeah, probably talking shit because I said HBO, but... Fighting a dude that... If you're a champ, well, actually, you know what? I'm lying. I, I, I don't know. No, I think the HBO card is up there. I, I know the Showtime has the Mares fight. No, 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 I think no, Vic. I'm not even saying that. What I'm saying is Jonathan Romero's fighting a, a guy that lost to a prospect, and he's a belt holder. So he's definitely a lame-o. Never been a lame-o. Never been a lame-o. You don't agree? You're not I don't think what are you doing on your keyboard over there, brother? Like, what? What are you doing? What are you talking about, dude? Like, you, you got to be typing or something. Like, you, you take forever to answer me back. Well, I'm, I don't want to cut into your uh, your limo, whatever that is. Come on, man. You know it's me and you, God, bro. It's killing me. It, they call they calling that Gail Barker a trash card. Oh my God. Yo, it's you me got, and you, you to the terrible, end, man. man. It's me and you to the end. Okay, we rollin'. Huh? You ain't poppin' no champagne. You ain't poppin' no champagne. You ain't hoppin' no damn Okay, okay we, we rollin'. Roll. Hey. Huh? Come on, dog. You know it's me and you to the end. Yo, so I guess that's the show, man. We ain't got no callers. We outie. Uh, as always, thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, thank our guests, Seth Mitchell and Heather Hardy, for coming on and giving us two great interviews. 
Uh, don't forget that the most important way you can support the boxing voice is, of course... Remember to rate us five stars on iTunes. iTunes is the biggest podcast directory in the world. Bottom line. So if you want more guys like Kimo calling in from Amsterdam or Jose from Canada, Molly Bangwe from South Africa, uh, Elver from Mexico... What's my guy's name from Argentina, man? I, I, I never remember his name from Argentina, and I always confuse Elver, but Elver's from Mexico, and I got it, Elver. So this is your personal shout-out. I know you're from Mexico. Boom. Because you know why? Because me and you... Okay, we rolling. You ain't popping no champagne. You ain't popping no champagne. You ain't popping no damn Okay, we rolling. Yo, you know I can't get through a show without showing my boy Danny Garcia some love and playing his, his clips, you know what I mean? It is what it is. Oh, here it goes. That's his name. Mali Alpha. Listening all the way from Argentina. Holla. Yo, so uh, we already said to review us on iTunes. Definitely. Uh, Make sure you like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at The Boxing Voice for the most up-to-date info on boxing. And subscribe to YouTube.com slash The Boxing Voice for the latest and greatest interviews with your favorite fighters. As well as check out theboxingvoice.com for some of the best articles on the hottest news in today's boxing. And don't forget, join us every Thursday and Sunday live at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Because this is your one stop place where tonight allows people a release for all the hatred that they keep up inside. Oh, yeah! This is always going to be the radio station where you can release any anger. Like, I'm really mad at Fortuna. Fortuna is not, you know, looking like the future because uh, Fortuna, I think that in Spanish means like fortune or English means fortune, but there's no fortune in what he did this past Friday. Bottom line, Dominican or not, he got to step it up. He's not looking good. He needs to get his shit together. Bottom fucking line. Um... Don't forget Canelo Alvarez gloves. Remember, go to theboxingvoice.com, click the donate button. One dollar and forty cents puts you in the contest for the Canelo Alvarez gloves. We'll be doing that giveaway. Uh, well, actually, given mentioning the name of the winner on nine fifteen, uh, the big night after the big fight. Um, what else we got, Vic? What do you got planned for Thursday? I have nothing planned for Thursday. <laughs> Whoa! <I'm told> <laughs> hey. All right. Slow boxing week, man. We get some good guests, man. We're gonna start getting some good guests here. Uh, we just got big, big Seth Mitchell mayhem. So uh, we'll, we'll, and uh, Heather Hardy, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it up, you know. But if you guys are getting tired of interviews, let us know, you know, because yeah, we are at the end of the day, we do whatever you guys say because. Yo, good boy, uh, <laughs> good boy, <laughs> good boy. <laughs> you know we some good boys over here. That has been the show. Uh, See you guys Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. I am your host, Ness GTO, at Ness GTO on Twitter. That is my co-host, Victor Salazar, boxing voice underscore Vic. We'll see you Thursday. Peace.